webinar series. This is actually our second series for 2021. On Monday, the 15th of February, we started off with the first series where we had an, uh, three international speakers join us. Uh, today, we have three new speakers, national speakers, that will be able to contextualize some of the developments that we had as part of Monday's discussion. The Academic Development Open Virtual Lab is a DHEAD COVID response grant initiative. Uh, and as you know, uh, as highlighted by our colleagues on our speakers on Monday, uh, the, COVID, the COVID crisis has actually forced us to rethink a lot in teaching and innovation. Uh, as part of the University of South Africa's 2016 to 2030 institutional strategy, one of its very first focus areas emphasized the need for us to accelerate the shift towards becoming a leading African Odell comprehensive university in teaching and learning research, innovation, and community engagement based on college scholarship. However, we know that given the rate of advancements with new technologies, and especially those coming up during the COVID-19 crisis time, uh, and those propelled by the fourth industrial revolution, that higher education in South Africa, given our socioeconomic context, as well as our institution, UNISA, runs the risk of being overtaken by the speed of these developments. One of the critical performance areas impacted by the pace of technology advancements in teaching is teaching and learning. This has resulted with us seeing new and innovative ways for delivering teaching and engaging learning processes amongst our students and our staff. Uh, it is against this background, colleagues, that we launched the UNISA Academic Development Open Virtual Lab and its Innovation in Teaching and Learning series on Monday. Uh, in this second series, we bring together three nationally acclaimed speakers to set the South African agenda for us on innovation in teaching and learning. Uh, at this time, I would like to take the opportunity to invite Professor Opal Mashile, who is the Executive Director for the Department of Tuition Support and Facilitation of Learning, and also the project owner of these DEAD projects. Uh, Prof. Mashile, thank you very, very much. I now hand over the floor to you for, to welcome us and welcome the colleagues. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chetty, for the uh, introduction and for uh, allowing me this uh, opportunity uh, to welcome uh, colleagues. Um, let me uh, uh, say it is uh, our privilege that uh, colleagues who have joined us uh, in this uh, seminar uh, series. COVID-19 really has, um, I mean, we, we, we could describe it as a disruptor uh, in, in our uh, education system, uh, not only in South Africa, but globally. And it has forced us to rethink how we engage with teaching and learning uh, in the, what we now call the, the new normal. Uh, COVID-19 has forced us to look at uh, a large number of areas in our, um, in our work, uh, from curriculum design to how we do assessment, to how we support students. Uh, as well as the general infrastructure that we need uh, as universities to, to teach in such an environment. Uh, at UNISA, uh, COVID-19 has forced us to look at what we really mean by being an open distance e-learning institution uh, in a context that is confronted by complex socioeconomic uh, challenges. Uh, it has further brought uh, to us to re-examine both our student and our staff profiles. COVID-19 has also pushed us into a digital space that we once were cautious of navigating. As I mentioned uh, on Monday when we uh, introduced the seminar series, one of the main areas that we need to urgently address uh, is academic development. UNISA defines academic development as uh, encompassing integrated, student-centered, targeted institutional initiatives 
that are aimed at enhancing the capacity of both staff and students to optimize student success within an ODEL environment. These initiatives are undergirded by the principles of blended learning, infused support, collaborative development of the curriculum, intervening with care, complexity in knowledge production and learning organization approach to teaching and learning. On Monday, when we launched the uh, Academic Development o Open Virtual Hub, uh, which is a DHEAD uh, COVID uh, response grant initiative, uh, we indicated that the primary aim uh, was to develop academic capacity of both staff and students to make the transition to a digitally mediated teaching and learning space. As captured in the name of this initiative, this is a virtual hub that focuses on both UNISA and a national priority in academic development within higher education. Right, the, during the, the launch, uh, as indicated by uh, Mr. Chetty, we uh, invited uh, a group of uh, international uh, speakers um, uh, in the beginning of this uh, series, uh, whose aim is to broaden our insights to the global trends in teaching and learning and contextualize this within our higher education uh, landscape. So kick starting this uh, uh, series of seminars where Professor Marcus Specht, Dr. Andrea Santo, Dos Santos, and Dr. Ishe Moore. And we are, uh, yeah. Professor Specht uh, introduced us, sorry, to a series of technology innovations within the mobile teaching and learning context. Uh, mobile learning forces us to rethink curriculum design, delivery and learning pedagogy. And drawing on his own context in uh, Netherlands and the shift to mobile learning, uh, Professor Specht debunked the myth that mobile learning is only for a developing context. Dr. Dos Santos forced us to rethink what we mean by openness as an institution. In advocating an open pedagogy in a digital era, uh, Andrea highlighted four important dimensions that we must consider. Technology, quality, strategy, and leadership. Dr. Dos Santos further argued that with the modernization of higher education, we need a mindset shift. UNISA needs to also consider its social mandate amidst the reduction uh, in student numbers. Uh, Dr. Moore, on the other hand, pushed us into an uncomfortable space as we started to reflect on blended versus hybrid education. The notable challenge is how we contextualize some of these concepts that differ from international usage. Dr. Moore highlighted the need to reposition our students at the center of this hybrid approach. He further highlighted the need for, provide, for, for providing our students in terms of location, age, digital competences that should drive our pedagogical agenda. This morning, we bring together three key speakers to further unpack the international trends and what innovation in teaching and learning means for us in the South African higher education context. So we really uh, are privileged and would like to welcome uh, Paul West, Tony Lelliot, and Matsepo Matuani to this seminar series. And really we're looking forward to uh, your wisdom and uh, sharing your expertise in these fields. And we trust that we will have an engaging forum where we could help each other to uh, focus on how 
uh, we could strengthen the ADVO project. Let me also welcome uh, all uh, colleagues who have joined us in this seminar series. We really uh, appreciate the time that you are spending with us and we, we hope that uh, as we uh, engage and as we share uh, ideas, uh, we will be able to provide a well-rounded uh, and informed uh, academic development uh, project, not only at UNISA, but at uh, our institutions. Uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much. Kalewa. Thank you very much, Prof. Mashile, for setting the context for us, those warm words of welcome, and also for recapping some of the uh, the highlights uh, or the key aspects that we've uh, learned from the Monday series. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. And as we know, especially that you are busy, but thank you for taking the time for us and joining us at this time. Uh, colleagues, uh, once again, welcome to all those that are joining us. Our CR numbers are increasing. Uh, we've got colleagues from UNISA as well as some from outside UNISA. So thank you for joining us and welcome to today's session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we did on Monday, the procedure for our seminars, uh, you'll notice that you all uh, mute. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, it's easier to control the uh, the process of the, uh, of the seminar. However, please feel free to post your comments uh, your questions uh, in the in the comments tool in the chat tool and while the speakers are presenting we will then raise those questions during the Q&A session but we found that we, we will also then open the mics uh, so that you can unmute during the Q&A session and pose your questions directly to the speakers uh, which allows for much more interactive engagement so thank you colleagues and we look forward for a very engaging session uh, this this afternoon this morning at this time, it gives me much pleasure to welcome our first uh, speaker for today, Paul West. Uh, I had the opportunity of meeting Paul a few years ago when he was quite interested in UNISA's development and open education resources uh, and how we could advance the agenda in, uh, in Africa itself. So Paul is a senior education advisor. He's also the South African chapter lead in the Creative Commons and a Creative Commons board member. He's worked for two Commonwealth intergovernmental agencies in Canada and the United Kingdom during the last 20 years. Paul West is now an independent consultant in the fields of open education resources, open learning, open copyright licensing, knowledge management, uh, ICT in education and project management. Uh, he supports professionals and policy makers through key services, including using online collaboration and the aggregation and sharing of information and useful practices through consultancies and communities of practice. Uh, he has in addition developed and implemented policy and strategy on employability in Namibia, Rwanda, and Zambia. He served as a core member of the UNESCO chair in the ICDs for developments for these technology and education for the most marginalized post-COVID-19 report, uh, supported by DFID and the World Bank through their EdTech hub. He is the South Africa's chapter's lead for Creative Commons, as I noted earlier, and a CC uh, certified uh, older and training facilitator. He established a virtual university for small states of the Commonwealth and transnational qualifications framework. Uh, previously, Paul created the African Digital Library, a service that provides no cost access to full text ebooks to residents of African countries via the internet. And Paul this morning will be sharing with us becoming more open. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for joining us today and for your willingness to, uh, to share your knowledge with us. Uh, and I would like to welcome you to, to the floor, Paul. So thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Denzel. I just need to correct something on this uh, profile. I didn't realize that um, one error had cropped in. I am not on the Creative Commons board. I'm only the chapter lead for South Africa. So I just need to correct that so there's no misunderstandings. And while I'm at it, um, let me just mention this African Digital Library, something I did in 1999 when I was with Technicon SA. Um, during the merger in the early 2000s, it was moved to UNISA. And so UNISA is still the host for the African Digital Library. It provides free access to proprietary books for anybody living in an African country. And it's technically hosted by EBSCO Host. So it's something that uh, you can be proud of, I think, still it's got probably at least 10,000 books in it, and something that you can use and your students can use. All the digital books in it are uh, purchased in perpetuity, so they should still be all there. Um, thank you for that. 
And Denzel, I'm going to share my desktop in just a moment. Just let me find the correct window here. I think I've got it. And you should be seeing my slides coming up now. Thanks. Um, I'm not going to be able to see the uh, chat at the same time. So I'm going to talk. And then if you can please help with the questions during the session afterwards, as you mentioned. I hope my slides are coming through clearly. There's a QR code. If you use your telephone, you'll be able to pick up a, um, a V card for, for me. And my information will be uh, provided later. These slides will be available to you as a download in a PDF as I finish. So please don't bother to write down anything you see on the slide. It's um, all going to be provided to you. There are lots of links, and you can then use those links as a resource pack afterwards. During this presentation, I'm going to be speaking quite a lot about copyright and legal stuff. But I need to say straight away that nothing I say should be misconstrued as being legal advice. I'm not a lawyer, and we're having a general chat, and I can tell you the things that I've learned along the way. I have done the Creative Commons Certificate course, so I've done that, and I'm also a Creative Commons facilitator for the certificate course. So you can at least rest assured that I have got that training, but I'm not qualified as a lawyer or registered as a lawyer. And if you want legal advice, what's called legal advice, you need to contract a, a lawyer and to pay them and do all of those sort of things. So we're gonna have a conversation about um, being open and various aspects of it. I like to always start with, why am I bothering to do this? Should I maybe be doing something else? Or is this something I should spend my time on? And what I've got here is a comic that comes from India. And this was at the early days of, of uh, COVID. Uh, I'm really into trying to equalize the playing field. While some of us today are connecting through 20 meg fiber lines or 100 meg fiber lines, others of us might be connecting through cellular lines and they're not as stable. And some people might not be able to afford the bandwidth needed to attend this seminar today. So there's a whole big equalizing that needs to go on, and we need to find ways to solve this. So that's my interest. When we come to OERs and op being open, the story, very often people speak about it starting in 2002, but it actually doesn't start in 2002. A, a discussion forum in the early 2000s came up with a name it had nothing to do with formal structures or management meetings or decisions by government. It was a bunch of people who were in the movement and creating the movement that decided on the words open educational resources. And it could have just as well been open courseware or something else. But that was a decision that they took at that time. So I'm going to go a little bit earlier than this and just try to give you some context of where this comes from. Sharing of education resources would have started in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Originally, certainly when I was studying part-time and working, I would have shared stuff. I just used a photocopier, I copied stuff, and I gave it to somebody else. It would have been copyrighted, but I shared it anyway, and I'm sure everybody else did. And I'm sure everybody else did that as well. So we've been copying stuff forever. David Wiley's name is there because he's one of the earlier names that one finds in this OER world. He was the person who created the first open license, and then he gave it up later on. I'll get back to why. Um, and the W and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation is probably the single biggest reason that this movement exists. In the early 2000s, they put at least 100, 100 million US dollars into funding this field, and they put multiple millions into projects that were tying universities in the US and Africa. And in some of those meetings, I was giving, giving them reprimand, saying them, you cannot just give 10 or 20% of a funded project to the university in Africa, and giving the balance to university in the US. You need to make people equal partners. So that is the stuff that was happening in the early 2000s. In the 80s and 90s, there was another source of this open world coming together. The Free Software Foundation, the GNU project, the Linux project, all of these things were happening because of people such as Richard Sorman and Linus Torvalds. And this, this brought a whole different uh, line of thinking. It was an open, free thinking, and they have a different set of licenses. They don't normally use the Creative Commons license. Their licenses are much older. They have much more history to them. 
And, but that is a, a, a great influence that is influencing the people who started the OER movement. Finally, this third um, area, the copyright world, there was the so-called Mickey Mouse Protection Act I'm going to speak about in a minute, and the name Lawrence Lessig. And this is the person who created Creative Commons. So this is a very important one, but it's not the only um, cause of the OER movement coming together. On the right-hand side of this diagram, you'll see some of the movements that happened in 2019. Um, sorry, I'm going to start from the bottom of this. Um, there was the IIEP discussion forum about the virtual university. That was that uh, book that I showed you earlier. That was in the early 2000s. It came up to 2007, the Cape Town Declaration. I was fortunate to be there. In the Cape Town Declaration, um, the, the hottest topics were around the non-commercial clause and the no derivatives clause or restrictions as they're called. And so there was a lot of debate about that, but that came up with the Cape Town Declaration in 2007. In 2012, there was the Paris OER Declaration. Sir so John Daniel led that with um, Stemenka Uvlik um, And that caused uh, this movement to, to really take a world stage. Around the 2016-17 level, there were coal and UNESCO consultations around the world. I was working in London at the time and was very fortunate to be able to join the European consultations which took place in Malta. And that all led to the 2019 recommendation on OER. So there was a global consultation and then a recommendation went to UNESCO. And we'll return to that in just a few minutes. Here's a simple timeline giving you some idea of a few of the, the um, events that happened. Um, I haven't yet mentioned learning objects, but that was also something that came in. We had learning objects before we had OER. Uh, we still might have some of those uh, wandering around the internet, especially with some of the projects in the US. Um, David Wiley con coined the, the term open content and he wrote the first license. Larry Lessig created Creative Commons. One of the big issues that came up in the early 2000s was MIT when the lecturers were told they would all have to publish their materials as OER. The issue at that point was that MIT had been working behind closed doors. Just like most universities, um, they would deliver their lectures to groups of students and nobody outside of those lecture halls would know what was going on. And for the first time, the lecturers were told, well, you need to now have your material facing the entire world so everybody can critique what you're doing and you can't break copyright. And of course, sometimes lecturers make copies of things and they break copyright. So that was quite a big change for MIT. There was a lot of internal uh, eruptions about that, but eventually it came together. But that was more classroom-based open education resources. And many of us were at that time fighting for distance education, OER, the kind of thing that UNICE has done for over 100 years, that is what was really needed. And I think we finally got to the point where that is what's happening. But it started, one of these origins of OER was in the classroom. So it moves on to things like the Meta University uh, was, was uh, considered, the Cape Town Declaration, the OER Foundation with Wayne McIntosh. Wayne was at Commonwealth of Learning with me in Vancouver. He left there, he went to New Zealand, and he still lives in Dunedin, where he runs the OER Foundation. And then, of course, 2012 and 2017 and 29 all happened. Some of the background for this is copyright laws originally started in a world of print materials. It was always very expensive to, to reproduce materials and to move them around the world. But that all changed. What we've got now is a world of almost zero cost of reproducing materials. If we believe that the materials that we write are the product that we sell in an institution, then I think we might need to revisit what we are doing. Because if I go onto the internet now and I look for something, I'm going to be able to find information on virtually anything. So really what we're doing is not the, the, the reproduction of materials. It's much more the services built around those materials. And I'm sure you've had hours of debates of that in, internally. But what we can do is we can share materials on a scale that nobody ever could have thought of before. 
we're into the, uh, the levels of science fiction if we go back to the 1970s and 80s. It also puts us into a new tension. If we go back 100 and 200 years when there were horse-drawn carriages, you can imagine the, the tension that happened as cars came about. Well, we've got that tension obviously playing out about us. The publishers hate OER, apparently. Some of them love it because they've learned new business models. And we can talk a bit more about that later. So we need to somehow cope with the business models and the changes that are taking place. And all of this is influenced by the Creative Commons open licenses that came out 20 years ago. Let's move on. The origin of this I mentioned before is the so-called Mickey Mouse Protection Act. It's actually the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. And in the US, um, various lobby groups were pushing for the, the length of copyright to be extended from 50 years to 70 years past the death of the creator of the resource. And this did influence um, the copyright of the uh, Disney Foundation. And Larry Lessig was the person who took this to court and unfortunately he lost the case. So the loss of this stimulated his thinking to creating Creative Commons, which happened in 2001. And it just happened to be at about the same time as the OER movement was coming together. So all of these things were coming together in around 2001, 2002. And I can tell you in 2001, was when I moved from Rudapur, Johannesburg, to Vancouver, Canada. And I worked for the Commonwealth of Learning for the next nine years, and that was why I was involved in this whole movement. So I'm going to go through the CC licenses with you in the early part of this talk. Um, some of you may know all of this stuff backwards, but it's important that we try to get a common base of understanding of what these things are about and where some of the possible pitfalls are in the future. So these are licenses, um, you attach them to materials that you've written and you can then share the materials worldwide. And I can tell you if I was to write something for somebody now, I expect that I, I would like to go to as many people as possible around the world who could benefit from it. I don't want it limited in some way. Unless of course, if you're going to sell it at huge profit, then I would ask you to share a little bit of that with me. So I'm going to come back to these things. The Creative Commons organization is a worldwide organization. A few of the staff are based in the US, but many are based in countries other than the US, are based around the world. The network manager is somewhere in Europe. I can't even remember which country. She moves country every now and then. And so other people are in various countries around the world. The licenses, especially the version 4 license that we're using now, are, were created by a teams of people around the world. They were not created in the US. So if somebody says to you, oh, but this is an American license, that's just simply not true. It's rather a destructive thing to say now. Um, Professor Tobias Schonvet in Cape Town at UCT was one of the people who helped to write these licenses. So many people around the world were involved in this. The licenses are used by many big organizations. Commonwealth of Learning, I was with in the 2000s, decided to adopt it as a standard, so has UNESCO and the World Bank. Um, we'll know the Siavula Open Textbooks project in Cape Town, which was funded by Mark Shuttleworth originally, but now, of course, they have to make their own way. These are just a couple of examples, but there are many, many um, organizations around the world that are using them. And I'm going to start to introduce the six licenses to you. But first, I want to again emphasize this probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and specifically two people in the early 2000s that I got to know. The Kathy Cassidy and Mike Smith, they were the ones who created and chose to put the money into this movement. So it's very important that we go back and understand this little piece of history that everything is driven by money as are these seminars that we are participating in now. Somebody's going to pay for the, um, the Microsoft Teams. Um, so there's always money involved, and it's important that we have money to grease the wheels of making these projects work. So that was the Hewlett Foundation's work. These licenses benefit anybody, but they're not normally used for software licenses. Those are the other licenses, like the GNU licenses and, and others. We don't talk about the software with this, but any other form of creative work 
we can apply a Creative Commons license to. And they're used by all sorts of people like us who are online right now. There is a Creative Commons Global Network. You all are invited to join it. There is no cost to it. As is, there's a South African chapter. Um, it's available um, free of charge. There's no structure to it, no organization to tell you how to live or do anything. Um, but it, there is a chapter of more than 50 people. We even have some members from other countries now. Some of the other related organizations would be Wikipedia, the Mozilla Foundation, and of course, Wiki Educators. In the last 20 years, Creative Commons has been, licenses have been attached to more than two, nearly 2 billion works on over 9 million websites. It's quite a lot. So if somebody says to you, they are thinking of writing an open license, I don't know how they plan to get them popular when they're comparing the two billion works. The whole intention of the movement is to create openness, to share materials more, and the purposes of that is as the comic I mentioned earlier, and there'll be another comic later that will hopefully show it a little bit more as well. So anybody can use these licenses, and anybody is welcome to join the, the national chapter. What we've got now is an internet that has made distribution and sharing of copyrightable works possible with a click of a button. We don't have to print it and send it by post or do anything else. When we talk about OER, we need to remember the five R's. This is where David Wiley's name comes in again. Um, possibly another webinar just by David Wiley is a useful thing to think about. The five R's are to retain, revise, remix, reuse and redistribute. Retain is an important point, and we're going to revisit that once or twice more in the presentation. To retain means that I can go onto the internet, I can find this resource, possibly one of you have written it, I can download it, and I can save it on my computer. If I don't have the, the right to save it on my computer, I can't really use it, can I? I must be able to revise it. Um, preferably, there are some materials that you might feel very protective over and that you cannot revise, but normally, I should be able to revise the material to suit my class or my group of students or my purposes. I should be able to remix materials. So if I take materials from three different um, institutions or sources, I should be able to pop them together in a legally combinable way. Reusable, so I should be able to use it again and again. I should be able to then redistribute this across the internet. So these are five core principles of anything being open. And that comes from Monday's discussion. This is the basis of it. This is where the OER movement has come from. <clears throat> the 2019 recommendation on OER by UNESCO <clears throat> was done after the consultations around the world by uh, the Commonwealth of Learning, mostly with U UNESCO. And it then reworded things slightly to say stakeholders to create access reuse, adapt, redistribute OER. Mostly it's there, but the one important point that's not there that we need to keep in mind is to retain. I must be able to keep this on my computer and nobody should be able to come back to me later to say, uh, you weren't allowed to save it on your computer, you now owe me a, a fine or a fee or something. So we must include retain when we are thinking about this and, and implementing things. So look out for the warnings. There's a link there when you get this PDF later, you'll be able to click on the link and get that. This is part of the David Wiley warnings. So make sure that you, whoops, that you can um, retain the materials as well that you download. Include the five R's, that's the previous slide. Develop a policy. Um, there's a long link listed under this one. Is a uh, policy guide document that I had co-created with a few other people as part of a project last year. I'd recommend that you need to have a policy on OER, especially which license to, to allocate as a normal license. So one would have a default license, typically that's a CC BY or CC BY SA license, and then a process, a simple quick process that if some materials need a different license, for example, it needs an ND or a uh, an NC, then you'd be able to go quickly through that process to select the other license. But it needs to be one of the six Creative Commons open licenses. We need to try to be um, 
as inclusive and equitable um, as possible. Um, we need to try to develop the sustainability models for OER. Um, this is certainly in the publishing area where uh, they need to move their thinking on a bit from the old publishing model where they, a lot of the money was invested in, in taking risk of print-based materials. And now they can come up with much more efficient models and still make their money. Um, and of course, there's international cooperation because borders don't actually exist on the internet. Not really. When we're creating OER, we need to think about these four things. Access to editing tools. If I've created a piece of material and you want to download and edit that, does it mean if the tools that I've used would cost you 20,000 Rand or 40,000 Rand to buy, it means that it's not really accessible to you. I need to be able to create the materials in something that's fairly normal. So most of us today will be and already have used PowerPoint as one of our tools. So that's a typical tool that almost anybody's got. There is a line of discussion that goes that, well, PowerPoint is a commercial tool and I've still got to pay my thousand rand a year to get, or 1500 rand nearly, a year to get access to it. Well, in that case, if we are being serious about it, then we would be talking about using Open Office. You could have created the materials using a Microsoft package, and then you could always export it to an open package to say, here's a no cost tool that you can use to be able to edit my materials. The level of expertise required, if I create materials in a fancy package that would take the next person six months to learn, possibly I've spent a few years learning it, that also would be a bind to the person receiving it. I want to be able to edit the materials quite easily and not spend months learning how to use the tool. Meaningfully editable, is the, is the, does the material contain a scanned graphic that I cannot um, edit at all? Or, it, or is the a copy of the editable material? For example, if a PDF is delivered to me, I can't change the graphic in it. I would have to create it from scratch. So yes, I would be able to do it, but it would be more meaningful to me if I could also receive all the underlying assets, as they call them. The underlying digital assets would be the individual pictures or graphics that are editable on, them, on their own. And then um, the, the formats of these materials. If you send me a TIFF file, I won't be able to do very much with it unless if I can scan it back into a text format into something like an MS Word. So we need to have formats that work for us. Sometimes they just don't work, as you would know. So we need to try to cover all of these things. When we're looking for the license that we're going to use, at the moment, it's my understanding that UNISA doesn't have one license that it says is a default license. So you may want to go online and select your license. There are license choosers on the, on the websites, especially the Creative Commons site. I think this is the graphic of the newer one. And after a couple of questions, you'll be able to choose the license that suits your preferences most. And you'll see on there it says, do you want to, do you want attribution for your work? Do you allow commercial use? Commercial means for profit. Or do you want to allow derivative works, it's adapted works, and so on. Now I'm going to go into the licenses a little bit more because a, a basic understanding of this is needed. Otherwise, we can burn our fingers a bit. There are three levels of the license design in the Creative Commons licenses. There's the legal code, the so-called lawyer readable version. There's the, um, the human readable license, which is a very few words. And there's the machine readable license for computer programs. The lawyer readable one is that seven page or 15 page document that is in eight point font and is in complicated sentences and will take us the next hour or something to read. And it's the one that probably most of us just click past and say, we accept. When it's copyright, it could be a problem if, if you don't understand what the license says in it. But most of us don't read that license. That is the one that would go to court if we have a, a court case on anything. The human readable version, especially in the Creative Commons case, is the simple short text. It's the one that says, this is share alike or this is with attribution, and so on. So those are the short words. 
but you need to be careful that you understand that those words are properly represented in the legal code. If the legal code says something a little bit different, and I'm going to give you a hypothetical example in a few slides time, um, it could cause us problems. The machine readable one is for where we have um, programs that would go out and find materials and assimilate what licenses they're using and um, do work for us. So those are the three levels on each of the each of the six licenses. Now to the components. These are the pieces that we look at. This is more the human readable text. So the first one, you'll see a CC means Creative Commons, and then it says by, by, by attribution or with attribution. This means that if I'm creating the piece of material and I put it on the internet and you download my material, I'm asking you to please attribute my name in the work. You may change it, but you'd still say original work by Paul West was found in this place and carries this license and I've now adapted it and then you add your, your name to it after that. And if there was a third person that downloaded your adapted work, they would do the same. They would say original work by Paul West, adapted work by you yourself, and third person now says, and I've readapted that work. And this is how one can keep on adding to works and improving them and sharing them. The second one, SA, means share alike. This applies if you are adapting the work. So if I've created the work, and I put it online, you've downloaded it, and you shared it to a class, SA doesn't, does not apply. It only applies when you make an adapted work. If you're going to change something substantial in the work, and you're going to then pass it on as a new work. So you'll then attribute my name, you'll attribute your name, and you'll say, this is my new work. That is where share alike applies. And you should then use hopefully the same license and put it back on the internet so the more people can use it. The reason for that would be, when I put effort into this material in the first case, then I would want as many people to benefit from it as possible around the world. If you've adapted it, and I can influence you to share it further, that means even more people can, can share it. You may choose to translate it, you may adapt it to different circumstances, there are all sorts of changes that you might, might make. So hopefully we would adapt and share. If, for example, I like an example of um, um, material is created in, at the coast about a technical subject and it involves um, corrosion and all of those sort of nasty things that happens at the coast and then somebody at a college inland possibly um, where there's very dry air they reuse it they need to modify the material a bit for their audience and their audience says what is this corrosion stuff why are they making such a big deal of it in our part of the country corrosion isn't such a big deal and they might need to adapt it there are all sorts of adaptations that people might want to make now, the last two of the more controversial ones. The one you're more likely to hear much of the time is the NC, the non-commercial. I'm going to give you a little bit of the background flavor of this. Around 2005-ish, various people in the open education world was, were shouting at each other across, across the world, um, some wanting the non-commercial and some not wanting it. And there were various definitions of what this meant. I contacted Creative Commons and they did not have a definition for non-commercial, and it was their choice to not impose a definition. They said that it should be created by the law of precedent and that various countries should choose their own definitions. I wasn't happy with that, so being in the Commonwealth, I was able to send a note out to all the, um, the countries around the world, the Commonwealth countries, and we held a meeting first. The first meeting was in Johannesburg, in the pan area actually and the second meeting was in london and we came up with a, um, a general definition for non-commercial which was reasonably transferable across legal jurisdictions and the general consensus of the people who participated in that and they were lawyers and in one case an attorney general for one of the commonwealth countries um, these people agreed generally that for common use we can call this a non-profit kind of license because commercial gain, as, as the term used in this, is usually contributing to the bottom line, and that is after you've paid for your expenses. 
So it means that you can, with an NC on a piece of wood, you can still do cost recovery. I could take your material with an NC, I could go to PostNet, I could print 10 copies, and I could hand them out, and I could charge money for them, but the charge money means cost recovery. It's not to sell them. So we use a different terminology. And I can pay for the costs I'm, in, I'm incurring, including labor costs. I'm going to probably touch on that later, so please do check back with me if that's not clear. That's an important point. It's a non-profit license, and even a, a commercial publisher can use an NC material if they are able to ring fence the financials around that piece of material and show that they're not contributing to the bottom line of their for-profit organization. Finally, the no derivatives. As soon as you use a no derivatives, it's no longer called an OER. Anything that cannot be adapted is not called an OER. It's shareable, it's of value, it's many things, but it cannot be called an OER. Um, the words, the voices from around the world will certainly be raised up if somebody lists ND works as OERs, I believe. So in, in an ND work, a no derivative work, you would be creating the work and you don't want somebody to change a single word of it. They can share it, they can add it to their lecture notes, you can put it in as a, an appendix, um, you can put a link to it and refer students to it, but you cannot change the contents of it. The true OER um, specialists would say this is just insane, you can't do it, but I'd like to keep an open mind to say there may be some reasons for having it, and typically might be a legal topic or possibly some medical topics where if a derivative work goes out and it um, contains some misinformation, then you certainly don't want your name attached to it. It would be possible to have a work where you, where you list the license. Let's say you put down that you want your material to have a CC by SA license, but if somebody changes it, then you don't want your name attached to it. And that's something you could just write in plain English on the same page where you put your license. That would be a no derivative, sorry, a non-attribution, a non-attribution license. Mentioned on Monday was the degrees of openness. And I'm going to cover that in the licenses because degrees of openness, you can look at this technically. Is this in a format that I can edit or is it not? One extreme would be open, one extreme not open. So on this slide, we're going to talk about the license degrees of openness. At the bottom of the slide, are the two that are not OER. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because they have the ND clause in them, the no derivative clause. So that is the least free, but it's still usable. If I have a textbook that is 400 pages long and I have an ND on it and I have it on the internet, you can still refer to students to it and you can say, go to page 203 and read the next 10 pages and it's still useful to them. So I'm definitely open-minded to an ND being useful but you can't go and take that chapter out and customize and remix that chapter because I would have put an ND onto it. As I come up the drawing, the next one up says buy NCSA. So in this one, I'm asking you to please give me attribution for the work that I've put into this, this work that you're now going to download from me. I'm asking you to please use it non-commercially, and that means if you were to do Let's say you printed it, it's the simplest example. You're printing this to hand out to students in a class. Let's just use a simple example, physical example. You, could, you would have incurred the costs of printing and possibly uh, the cost of a person that you sent to go to, to the printer and all those sort of things. And you can certainly do cost recovery of all of that. But if you want to charge an extra 100 or 1,000 Rand on top of that for the sake of your pocket, that's when you need to come back to me to say, I would like to make some profit on this. Is that OK? And I'm going to say to you, well, yeah, if your customers are willing to pay for it, that's fine. But I'd like you to share a little bit of your profit back with me. That's all that I'm saying in it. So that's the NC. And then the SA is, if you should modify this material, please also share it with other people around the world so that the second version and a third version can become available. Then we move up to the next one, buy NC. So I'm saying to you, please give me attribution and use it for non-profit purposes. The next one up says buy SA. So I'm simply saying, 
give me attribution. And if you modify this work, please share it again with more people around the world. And at this top one is buy, is buy attribution. So I'm saying to you, you can customize this as you like, but just recognize that I did the original one, tell people that. And if I don't want my name attached to it, then I'm going to write a paragraph there and say to you, you're welcome to change this as you like, but as soon as you change a word, please don't mention me anymore. That's a possibility, but that's not a license. That's just a request from me as a potential author. At the top of this list is public domain. That's completely open. You give no attribution. Um, you can change it as you want. And this is when things come out of, of um, copyright. I'm going to come back to that in a short while. On the right, you'll see free cultural works. So they, if you look up on the internet for free cultural works, you'll find there's a specific definition. So the people who want free to work with free cultural works will only accept those top licenses there. And you'll see on the left-hand side, from most free to least free, I've spoken through that. But then look at the red writing as well, the special licenses. These are the an open license comments that one might hear. And I'm going to come back and revisit that a little bit more. Be careful when you have a license that, that is not one of these six licenses or public domain. Be careful there. The public domain is that top box. Everything is copyrighted as soon as you publish it. But after a period of time, it leaves that copyright. It's typically 50 years, 70 years, or possibly it's going to be more. I suppose that depends how old Donald Duck gets. Sorry, I'm just being facetious. Um, and after the set term, that copyright expires, the work enters the public domain, and anybody can copyright, adapt, and share that work. So this is the most free you can get. So this is at your most free side of OER. Laws do vary between countries, so you may need to um, investigate a little bit more, um, depending on where you are sitting, which country, in this case it's South Africa most probably, where the materials are coming from and where the materials might be used. UNISA works across many, many borders, so it is working into other legal jurisdictions, and so you need to be reasonably careful of all of that. There are various CC0 licenses. It's not a license as such, it's just a label. There's a link there to investigate further. Um, in the public domain, here's a, a Wikipedia page. Uh, I'm sure some of you hate Wikipedia, some of you probably like it. Um, it is still a massive and usually reasonably accurate um, encyclopedia, as far as I know. So there's a, a potentially useful page to, to refer to. You'll find on the Creative Commons website there are two logos. One is a CC0, the other one is simply a public domain mark. Um, and you can apply this if you're saying to people, here's a diagram or a piece of work, I'm putting it on the internet, don't even bother to recognize me, but you can use it as you wish. That's where you use public domain now. So you can put something into the public domain immediately without it waiting 50 years after you've left the planet. Now for the take cares. License proliferation has always been a possible threat, but I've heard the words and open license in various documents and people talking over the last five years or so. And this is where there's a, a higher risk. And I'm going to give you a hypothetical example now. If let's say I wrote a piece of material and I chose to write my own open license, and I could do this. I'm not a lawyer, but I could do this. I could take a Creative Commons license Let's say it was a CC BY license. No, let's make it a CC BY SA license. I can then use the same logos that, that say to you in plain English, the human readable version, this is CC BY SA. Sorry, this would be my open license. So this is O, open license, OL, BY attribution, and SA. So this is my own private license. It's now not a CC license anymore. But what I do is I borrow the wording from a license that I know very well. I go into that license and I change, edit, or add, uh, add or delete just about five or six sentences. And then I put this material online. You quite innocently, innocently come along and see open license by SA. And you say, well, this is the same as what I've always seen. And you take the material down, you adapt it, 
you um, give it to your students, you follow the essay requirements and you publish it on your website. But then I contact you and I say to you, did you read the legal print? And you say, and you say to me, of course not. I don't do that. Um, but in the legal print, I've now added little clauses like I could, for example, I'm, I may be overplaying this, but this is an example. Perhaps I've put in there, I'm giving you access to this material. I'm not giving you the right to save it on your machine, which means that if you save the copy, you've broken the license. I could say to you, you you've got the right to adapt this material, but if you want to share it with somebody else, you must first send it back to me and I will have my people check this material and give you edits that you must make before you're allowed to change it. So I, I could put in the fine text that I'm trying to control your adapted work. There are all sorts of extras I could put in there. You may say to me, well, who cares? I'm just going to do it. But what if I've also put into this contract a, or into this license a little section that says um, penalties? And say, should you save this on your machine, you will pay me 5,000 Rand. Should you adapt this and share this with people without my permission, you will pay me 10,000 Rand per page. And I, as soon as I've done that, and as soon as you you clicked on the create buttons to download it, you've entered into that contract and you would have um, accepted those terms. And that's what I believe the court would be looking at. As I've said before, this is not legal advice. This is just my layman's opinions, but it's a risk that I'm certainly not prepared to take. So if it's not a CC license, I'm certainly going to either have to read every word of the license and understand it, or I'm going to have to um, get somebody to do it. So a lawyer would have to do it for me and I'd pay for that. So that's my biggest warning in all of this, is be very careful. If it's not a CC license, you need to understand what you are getting into. The CC license, they're standard, they've been used two billion times. We have a pretty good idea and consensus as to what things mean. Um, there's some useful links here, I think. Um, OER use Creative Commons licenses. There's a link to there to a chooser, so you can investigate that further. Uh, we can mix materials from different licenses. It gets a little bit more complicated in this area, but you can mix materials from different licenses. You have to be careful. There's a table for it. There's a link there to go to the study material. You see in the URL, it says chapter four. So this is from the course. This is how Creative Commons actually teach this. So this is the material that is being checked by lawyers all the time. So it's, it's pretty good. And it's something that if you are going to mix materials, you need to understand that stuff. The attribution I've re referred to quite a few times. This is the BY. So most of the materials would have BY on it. There's a link to, to it there. And I think I've got another slide that uh, gives the attributes. I'll just mention it here. It's uh, the TASL is title, author, source, and license. So title would be the title of the picture or the material I'm giving. The author is my name as the author. The source is a URL for where you can download this material. And the license is the full URL, full license, uh, Creative Commons license, and preferably put a link straight to the license code so that anybody downloading it can go and investigate what the license means. So that's the attribution one should do for everything that you receive and, and, uh, and use. <clears throat> and I've put two lines at the bottom of this. Just ask. If the license doesn't give you what you want, if let's say I've shared a piece of material under an ND license and you would like to adapt it, don't be shy. Write and send an email and probably find the person on the internet, send an email and say, I really like your material, but it doesn't suit my students. I would like to do this and that to it. Is that okay? Especially if you're not sure about anything, do that. Everybody creates a list of how to find OER. One of the complaints one hears quite often is, um, yeah, there's apparently OER, there's two billion works, but I can't find what I want. And everybody, sorry, and their dog, and me writes their own list of where to find OER. So the URL there is a um, Google spreadsheet um, that I'm, I've been assembling for a while for the various consulting projects that I work on. And I give this links, the same link to anybody to say these are the sources that I've found and you're welcome to have a look at them. So that's my particular list and many other people would have a list as well. 
UCT has a content finder. This has got quite useful looking uh, course materials in it, so you might find that useful. IOSIS is a, an open publisher in South Africa, and you'll find a link there, and I put it onto social media again in the last day or so. Um, so that could be a useful link. A BC Campus, this is in Canada. They have, for example, this list of, of open textbooks, open stacks in Rice University in the US has open textbooks, and there are many others. So there are lots of open textbooks you could be um, using for students. And the purpose of that is heavily to try to reduce the cost to the student. That is one of our barriers to learning, I believe, is the cost of all of this. So let's go back and just refresh on why are we doing this? Well, this is the second comic I wanted to share with you. This one is from the US. I know we always think in South Africa that we have the worst in the world, but every country has its challenges. Some of us, as I mentioned earlier, are sitting with 20 meg fiber lines, and some of us are sitting with cellular lines. I'm not sure if any of you are using a cell phone to watch and listen to this. We need to try to, to help everybody across the spectrum. And the right hand side here, I see this person still got a laptop and a broken chair. And I think in our case, many of the students are studying on a cell phone. That must be quite difficult. 20 years ago, when I was starting to read books on, on Palm Pilots, uh, my colleagues at Cole would say to me, that's impossible. Nobody's ever going to read books on, on digital devices like this. And that was proved not to be correct within 10 years. And I think now, if you went back 20 years and said people will study entire courses just about using cell phone sized, smartphone sized screens, they would consider it impossible. But now here we are, we're doing it. So let's try to help more people. I'm going to cover two last bits here. So I'm starting to wrap up. Um, I've been hearing quite a bit about open learning websites and open learning systems. And I did a post on social media fairly recently to try to clarify these two. The example I'm using here for an open learning website is the open learn site in the UK. So this is the, the open university in the UK. They started the open learning site in the early days of OER. And I can tell you there were lots of arguments about this and especially about which Creative Commons license they chose, but they got past it and they now have over a thousand free courses online. The business motivation for this is various. I'm not going to bother to go into that, but those are the open business models that one can talk about. So an open learning website I'm going to cover the two in two slides coming up. The picture at the bottom left here is the open learning sites. I'm going to talk about that one first. Then I'm going to talk about the potential for an open learning system after that. So on an open learning site, it would the, the website probably would be based on an LMS, a learning management system. It might, for example, be based on Moodle, which is used in the Open University in the UK. And I heard, Amanda, that you're busy migrating from Sakai to, to Moodle as well. So you're going to be using Moodle. Moodle is a system that can be run for one person or it can be run for thousands of people. <coughs> and it, can, it is quite scalable. But it is nevertheless a learning management system. So what this learning management system must be able to do, if it's an open site, a truly open site, is that I must be able to go onto the site and I should go through all the material without even logging in. And if you go to the OU site, you can do that. You don't have to register. You don't have to log in. You can just go through the material. That means they don't know who you are. There's obviously no certification to it, but they can, the only thing they know about you is your IP address, which possibly gives an indication that you're in South Africa. It may incorrectly say what part of South Africa, and even that might be completely wrong. So an open learning website, something like a Moodle, should be able to give anybody in the world free access to the course material. Then let's say after that, we do log in, and we participate in the course with automated assessments all the way through. We get to the end and we pass our 80% or whatever we must pass to, to get through it but in automated assessments. And I know there's all the issues about um, who's sitting in front of the computer and that, so that's not an issue for me right now because this isn't formal education. This is still non-formal education. 
But if I get to the end and I've done all of your assessments, surely I can get a little statement of participation, a little tick that says, yes, this person seems to have done this. We're not certifying it. It's not on the NQF, but we think they've done it. So that would be very nice to have on this open learning site. Then, then we've got the download option. If you go and take a look at the OU site, without logging in, you'll be able to download the doc version, the PDF, the Mobi, and the EPUB. So you can download all of these versions, and of course, the doc version you can go and edit. The PDF version you could print if you want to, or share it further. The Mobi and the EPUB are for e-readers. So this on the OU site, you can do without logging in, without registering. Finally, to customize, I must be able to do that, and that I can only do if I get a, an editable version. So if you send, if you have a link on your Moodle and it says download the Moodle course here, and it's some sort of zippy thing that goes into the back of another Moodle, that's not helpful to me as a user. I would need to be able to download the content in a, a reasonably usable format and something that I can actually open up and, and, and use in some way. So that to me is a, an open learning site. You may have a, I haven't even put a license on, on this, but your license would uh, need to accept all of these things, that I can access it, that I can save it, that I can uh, download it, and that I can modify it, and that I can share it again. That would be your license, probably a CC BY or CC BY SA. Now let's move to the possible futures. Um, an open learning system is something a whole lot bigger than that. A system would comprise many functioning units, and the Moodle that we've mentioned in the previous slide would be one of those pieces. There would have to be quite a few other pieces added to it. One would do this on a national basis or possibly across the world. Uh, a Commonwealth agency could do it for 54 countries. An African agency could do it for 54 countries. Um, the OECD could do it for all of their countries. But I think the greatest value would be across the developing world. So it would be very nice to be able to do something like this across the whole of Africa. And I think it's, it's feasible if one keeps in mind the automation as far as possible. So let's look more at the components of this. We would integrate into the system a way to support educators and learners. So if I am an educator sitting in Kigali, then I would go on to this open learning system and it would give me some tools to be able to create my course material, some support. If I'm a learner taking a course that's been delivered through the platform by UNISA or the African Virtual University, then I would be able to access some form of learner support. And I don't need to go into what learner support is, that's your business. Then I would expect that the materials development and the publishing of that materials is available online. Now there could be all sorts of workflow processes involved, but if I've developed material and I and my institution like it, surely this system, this platform, this bigger national open, continental open learning system could make provision for me publishing my learning material for other people to use. Um, technical access. We live in a, a continent where there are various levels of techni technical limitations. So I like to try to get things down to the lowest common denominator. Sitting in Pretoria, I get irritated to the extreme when my iPhone 5 can no longer download an app because Apple's decided to not update the operating system anymore and the app provider has decided to not support the level of operating system that I still use on an iPhone 5. Why should I spend another 20,000 Rand on a new machine? So that's where I'm talking about. Let's try to keep things to a lowest common denominator so that more people can use it. Many people have, have devices. Many people can go to a village or to a community, community center and can get access, but can they practically do it on their device? We must not raise the bar too high for anybody to use it. Then if we do put in um, formative and summative assessments and we've automated them very nicely, and we've tried to be reasonably sure that this person is the person who's done the whole thing, surely we can issue a digital badge or a credit, and we can keep those credits. And if I do 
a short credit with UNISA today and I do a longer, another credit with um, the African Virtual University tomorrow, surely this one platform can catch, capture those credits together. Now, they may be all very short courses and they may not add up to the qualifications that we would like to get. But in this day and age, I might not have the time or the money to be able to spend three years or six years or nine years doing the full-blown qualification. I need to be able to get the skills more quickly and to be able to get some level of, of um, recognition that I can do this so that I can go and sell my skills to an employer or possibly start my own micro business. Then if we're doing this, we do still need to consider the qualification frameworks. Of course, in South Africa, we hear about the NQF all the time, but that's by no means the only one. Botswana and Namibia and everybody else also have their qualification frameworks. So we need to consider how to do this in a practical way that doesn't get bogged down by bureaucratic nonsense forever. It's got to be something practical. And that, I've got no solutions for that, but I know people who, who can think through these things. I'm sure some of you could help greatly to, to figure out how to make that work. Finally, and this taps back to the open university, is the pathways from being an open learner doing a micro credit to being a formal learner later on. Many of us started out our working lives first and then migrated to correspondence studies in those days and then to night classes and combinations of correspondence studies at the same time. And eventually we got our qualifications, got some qualifications. Life doesn't start out from, for many people, or possibly most people, going into formal studies. So if we've started out by doing short qualifications or micro credits, what is that pathway that if I choose to get a formal qualification, how do I eventually get there? Even if I'm an older person, if I was 40 years old, what can I do to get from where I am now into where I would like to be? That touches on to career development, of course, as well. So that is a, a possible future open learning system. If you hear of somebody saying they've got an open learning system or a national open learning system, and it doesn't at least show these sort of things, then they possibly are dealing with a, um, an open learning, uh, an LMS, a learning management system, more than an open learning system. That how it clarifies that. So we could imagine, and certainly UNISA could imagine, a future where UNISA could take micro learning to, to scale. You're already doing learning across many, many countries. So you're already there, you already know what you're doing. You could take this down to the micro level and you could help hundreds of millions more people. Materials development online, you know what, that's, what that involves and a system could help with that that you could certainly support. Technical access I've men mentioned and you could certainly, with your experience, push this to massive levels of access. The digital badges and credits, I think you're already playing with that internally. Um, working across multiple countries, you already have experience at this and you have a footprint on many countries' earths. So this is something that's not foreign to you. And the pathways, I think, is also not foreign to you. So this is something that UNISA could actually be involved in. In these final couple of slides, I'm just going to give you the link for the uh, Creative Commons Network. Um, the global network is free to join. Please do join it. You'll find me on. Uh, the US call it vouchers. You must have two vouchers. Now, I know we use the word voucher for something you take to a supermarket. Their voucher is a... Um, American terminology was used, and this means a, a referee. So if you don't find one person in the list of people there, contact me and I'm sure we can come up with two vouchers or two referees. Um, how to select a Creative Commons license, there's a link for you or two links for you. The South African chapter, there are a few links, please do join up. Um, I just mentioned this is a report that I participated in last year. It was in the bio as well. Um, and specifically at the bottom, I've put in the guidance note um, for creating a policy on OER. Just some of the ideas in there. There's more to consider in the policy. I'm closing off with a, a little legal slide here. I've used much of the information in here. It came from the course that I did with Creative Commons. I'm giving attribution to Creative Commons for it. And I'm even saying where you can register for the, the course. But this is a full attribution that I've tried to use just as as a, a really full example, you wouldn't need to go to this extent, but here's an attribution. 
um, and this is my final slide. There's a link there to download these slides. You'll find that just two pictures are missing from it. The two comics aren't there. The links to, to access the comics are there. But the reason for that is because South Africa does not have fair use in its copyright um, legislation. It only has fair dealing. And I cannot give you those two comics uh, without breaking the law. So I've deleted the two comics and I've told you where you can find them. That is the best that I can do under the conditions of um, of the, um, the current circumstances. I'm trying to switch off my slides now. I'm just looking for where this Teams has got this thing for me. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so I've now dropped the slides there. Would you like to open the floor for conversation? I see there's a few minutes yeah. left here. Thank, thanks, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. I think you've captured this quite well, uh, but you've also given us a lot of food for thought to engage more critically with where we are. Uh, colleagues, your, your microphones are now on mute. Uh, just to acknowledge Richard right in the back end of the seminar, giving us technical support. Thanks, Richard. Uh, so colleagues, your mics are now, uh, you have now have the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, so please, uh, if you've got a question that you want, just raise your hand uh, or post in, preferably raise your hand and then we will uh, acknowledge you and give you the platform. Uh, Paul, I just want to capture, I think while we are waiting for colleagues to, um, to raise their questions, I think you've raised some critical uh, issues for us at UNISA as well. Uh, more specifically, the shift from uh, copyright to open licenses which forces us to rethink the business models. And I know this is a, much of a debate in higher education as well, uh, specifically come from the DEAD policy on open education. And, and the kind of points that you also highlighted, which is something that we need to consider within UNISA as well, is the impact of technology or the choices of technology that we choose, uh, what type of technology we choose, and its impact on openness. Uh, and we haven't actually had that discussion. So I think that's quite critical is what type of technologies we use and how open are those type of technologies. Uh, and, and you've seen in the in the midst of the, um, the discussion, uh, colleagues were also uh, articulating quite uh, interestingly, uh, is the, the need for us to rethink and align or realign some of our current policies in the institution that may pose as an obstacle towards moving more open. Uh, so that means we, we we need to rethink the policies that are currently in place and look at how we engage with those from an open perspective uh, at UNISA. But it also, as, as we highlighted, it gives us a good opportunity for us as UNISA to contribute towards knowledge production discourse, uh, more specifically within the African continent, um, and, uh, and, and become a key player in this. Uh, I also like the, the latter part of what you said, uh, the two last points on open learning. Uh, and some QA elements that maybe we need to, as an institution, go back and look at uh, is how we define openness, which goes back to the discussions on Monday with Dr. Andrea, uh, Andrea uh, in Marato as well. It's the different levels of openness and what we mean by openness. And then the last point that you noted, uh, noted on the OERs and uh, the accrediting bodies, and, and it could possibly open up a new space for UNISA as well uh, in the African continent specifically for OERs uh, and the OER causes and accrediting as well. So thank you very much for that, Paul, and for those interesting points that you've raised, but also the ability to contextualize it to our own institution and our own African context, uh, following some of those trends that you've got. So colleagues, I'd like to open up the space now. I know there's uh, there's a lot of colleagues that are from the instructional design. Uh, there's some colleagues that have worked with OERs in the institution that have shaped policies before as well. Uh, so colleagues, let me open up the space for you. If you've got a question, simply pick up your hand. Uh, and then the floor is yours. Denzel, while we wait, I can just mention that I've put a, a replacement link into the chat, and I think that one does work. Uh, thanks, Paul. Colleagues, any questions? It's either completely confusing or completely clear. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, I, I I know that uh, the colleagues are. There's been some interesting discussions on quality. Uh, 
it's as soon as I think somebody has raised their end. Uh, if I can figure out who this is quickly. OK, here we go. Uh, Henry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Denzel. Just checking with uh, Paul. Uh, you mentioned uh, the need for policy direction uh, that will shape or govern uh, the actual work that we will eventually publish uh, for reuse, retaining for SOER. So, uh, what I want to to hear or clear from you in the past few years or so, most of our colleagues in the institution have been writing pieces here and there uh, that they define or termed SOERs. They, we, they are willing or wishing to share it uh, as widely as possible, SOER. But we, we clear that we do not have that uh, uh, policy or strategic, uh, uh, dif uh, uh, not direction, but, but decision as to what form of license do we go for, creative license do we go for, and, and therefore, we will not be able to to publish that as OERs. So, do we still call them OERs as they are, as we have intentionally designed them, or we can only publish them as OERs once we have that uh, uh, strategic uh, decision on licensing? Thank you. Thank you. That's interesting. I think you need to have the license on the material. Um, I think that's the most important. Whether you have a policy that tells you which license you should be using or not, that's an institutional choice. So I think so long as the lecturer has the right to publish the materials under a license, that's fine. But we wouldn't want the institution to come back to the lecturer later to say, you didn't have the right to publish this because we own the material and we have to make that choice. I think you possibly have a little risk to the lecturer until such time as there is a policy. There mm. is a template policy um, published by the Commonwealth of Learning. Um, I can look for it and I can share a copy, um, a link to, to Denzel, and then he can share it. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so the, and there's a tool available online. I'm about to use the tool with the group in Zambia to write a policy. So it's not that difficult to write the policy, but somebody needs to, a group of people need to sit together and write it and decide what the institution should do. And you need to then um, have it formally approved to, to give the lecturers protection. Uh, thanks, thanks Paul. Uh, yes, I, I think Andrew's question is quite interesting. There are colleagues at Janisa who are already adapting uh, a selective uh, type of OER license. I think now it's a matter of us having a default license that we can all agree on in the institution, that this should be uh, the license that the institution goes by. And this might be, uh, it's actually something that we, we need to look into uh, as a default license for the university. Uh, and similar to what you said earlier, Paul, as a way that uh, if there's need to uh, think of variations of the license, then we just have a, a separate process for that. Uh, but Prof. Mashila is also in uh, in the in the audience with us, and I know that this would fall under him uh, in terms of the OERs as well. So the default yeah. license is something that we would definitely need to look into. Uh, but more specifically, I think the the legal implications about this uh, would uh, would HR the copyright issues, uh, intellectual property issues, uh, as well as how do we then standardize uh, the OER license in terms of a strategic mm -hmm. policy in the institution. Uh, this is something that we would need to look into. Yeah. Um, okay, so colleagues in. Yes, yes. Paul. Sorry, Denzel, you're going to touch on two things there. One is how open is open. And let's just mention it. Um, CC BY is considered the most open license, but CC BY SA will possibly do the most good. The SA would help to push the materials out through multiple layers, whereas without the SA, it might not do that. But adding the SA, philosophically, I think it is would say this isn't as open because I'm actually you, you're putting a restriction on me. So there's just a, a consideration. So whether it's CC BY or CC BY SA. And then if you're doing this, just think about the remixing issues. Um, it gets quite confusing 
um, you need to have that table of the remixing and to try to understand it and debate why you can mix this with that and not that with this. And there are people in Creative Commons, one can go back to it to say, we just had a brain explosion, we cannot understand this anymore, we cannot put this into that. So there are people who can help. Thanks, Denzel. Thanks, thanks, Paul. Uh, colleagues, any other questions that you may have? I think, uh, okay, so I see there's no other questions. So colleagues, we are, we now have two minutes to 11 uh, a.m. I think what we'll do is we'll take a two minute interval break for your coffee and body break, and we will come back in the next two minutes and have our next speaker. So I'll give you two minutes to quickly grab your cup of coffee or a body break, and then we will introduce the next speaker, which is Dr. Tony Lilliet. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, thank you colleagues. Uh, it now gives us a uh, privilege to invite our next speaker, speaker two for today, uh, to the platform. Our next speaker is Dr. Tony Lilliet, and he's going to be talking to us on alternative approaches to CPD for university academics and librarians. So let me give you a, a snippet of a background for of Dr. Tony Lilliet. He is the program specialist in the area of teacher education with Sadie, an NGO based in Johannesburg. Uh, Sadie has worked with us at UNISA for some time, so I'm sure you all are familiar with the work of Sadie. That Sadie is the co-leader of the OER Africa Professional Development Project. Prior to joining Sadie, Tony worked in several leadership roles at the University of Witzbatenstrand. Uh, he is the author of 25 publications in refereed journals and books and has supervised 10 doctoral and 10 master's graduates to completion. Thank you very much, Tony, for joining us today uh, and sharing your time with us and your knowledge and experience and expertise in this space as well. Uh, so Tony, officially welcome to the Adobe Teaching and Innovation Series. The platform is now yours. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I will be sharing my screen in a moment. Um, that screen will, if I share my, okay, it's gone, right. Um, before I do that, though, so thank you very much for uh, inviting us to come and talk today. Um, I think this is a fantastic series, and I was very, uh, I, was, I was so pleased to be um, uh, watching 
Paul's presentation because uh, it uh, really speaks to um, the history of OER, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really interesting. I just wanted, before I actually put my presentation up, just wanted to mention two quick things. One is that um, Sadie uh, was asked by the Commonwealth of Learning to develop a, a relatively simple guide to um, adapting OER for Pacific Island countries. And I was doing a section of that. Um, they only want it as a Word document and a, and a PDF. So I was trying to see how I could make it interactive. And um, one of the ways was to maybe include a PowerPoint and do something with the PowerPoint. And I, there was a particular topic I was looking for the PowerPoint on. And as we do, went onto the internet to have a look to see if anyone written on that particular topic. I found a PowerPoint up there from the year 2000. I saw who it was by. I then Googled the person's name and um, she had moved to another university, but she had a web page at the university. Um, and basically, I wanted permission to adapt her PowerPoint and use it in these materials. And hopefully she was going to openly like, you know, she would give me permission or give it an open license. Remember this, she wrote, she did this in 2000. So I um, wrote to her, she replied within a few hours and was amazed. She didn't even remember that that thing or know that that PowerPoint was up there. And um, she then said she would, uh, she would put in the public domain. So uh, I took out some things, some specific things, um, and then uh, she's given permission for it to be in the public domain. So it's just an example of this sort of um, stuff we can do. Um, the whole point of having the Creative Commons license is that you don't have to get in touch with the, with the author. Uh, and, uh, but that was one interesting thing. The second thing was um, uh, Paul struck a chord when he, he mentioned that his iPhone 5 didn't allow some software. I was very miffed when I found my iPhone 6 did not allow the COVID alert app to be put onto it. So we were all told, please put the COVID uh, alert app onto your smartphone. And mine would not allow it because it was too old for the software to work. So these that really did strike a chord. OK, I'm going to talk today then about, um, let me share my content. Correct screen, and I will put it to presentation mode. Just waiting. Okay. So Denzel, is that visible now as a presentation? Thanks, Tony. It's visible. Yeah. Okay. I can maybe you can turn my camera off as well. I, sorry, I'm now. <laughs> when you put the presentation up, you can't get the other controls, but. Um, uh, you can turn my camera back off. OK, so this is what I'm going to be talking about today, and it certainly resonates with some of the things Paul was talking about. Um, and I hope also um, the guest speakers going after me. Um, we, as, you, as you've heard, I work in SADI, and we um, have a, an initiative called OER Africa. Um, the OER Africa is a, um, it's basically a website and has a, a number of various things to do with OER. You can download a lot of OER courses, etc., etc., from there. Um, it's a partnership between um, ourselves and, at the moment, Neil Butcher and Associates working with us on OER Africa. And uh, we really are focusing on higher education across Africa. Um, it's currently funded by the Hewlett Foundation. So that's the background to what I'm talking about. Now, in looking at the um, the idea of continuing professional development for academic staff. Um, we wanted to try and look at ways of changing how this could happen. And in looking at the issue, um, we have found, that, and you will probably be familiar with this, the predominant models for CPD are face-to-face -face workshops. There are a lot of those. And of course, there are also formal courses. 
So if we are um, wanting to change things, we've got to try and in a way disrupt maybe those two things because they do take the academic staff away from their working um, conditions. Um, if they're attending a, a day workshop even or a five day workshop or whatever, they're being taken out of their environment. And um, if they're doing a course, they could actually get out of their environment for extended periods. In some cases, that might be a good thing, but in many cases, it's not. Um, the, we also thought that in, when we were looking at the various CPD options available, um, many of the options don't really help the academic staff to, 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 to work effectively or efficiently. They're not necessarily set up to do that, um, but they are used to it. The, they are very much used to, if you're going to do some professional development, you will go on a course or you'll do, you'll attend some workshops. And this, I put this in red, they are used to it because this is an area, if we're going to try and disrupt it, it's quite difficult because, because they are used to it. And I'm an academic, I mean, I'm a former academic, I was at Vits for, for over 20 years. So we know what, what I know what um, we, we get used to. Um, there's another area, and this relates to Paul's uh, presentation. Um, there's still a lot of widespread lack of awareness about open licensing and OER. I must admit, I've been working in with it with OER for the last four years since I've been at SETI, but prior to that at WITS, it was uh, an area that I didn't know very much about. Um, it was not uh, a major part of my work. If I wanted to uh, uh, produce a course, it wouldn't necessarily have been a, uh, an OER. So, um, and that was partly because of lack of awareness. So the vision of OER Africa at the moment is to have a situation where academics are capacitated and they are supported through institutional policies. Now that's something that we were talking about a, a short while back um, earlier in the earlier presentation. The idea of having institutional policies that are supportive of, of academic staff. And the other part of our vision is that they can implement OER practices that actually contribute to the quality of the education of students. And that's the crucial thing because um, the idea of academic development is, is about students, it's also about staff. And we, in the end, want the academic experience of students to be improved. So a possible solution that we have, have come up with is um, we need a more diversified and flexible range of activities. So moving away from the, the courses and the workshops, we need to think about how we can uh, work with CPD that is not just that. And what we've done at the moment is to have developed a set of, we're calling these things learning pathways. And they are essentially mini tutorials, but they are bite-sized. They are very small. We're trying to keep them very small um, deliberately so that they can be built up into something bigger as necessary. So, um, and they're varied. I'll show you what they are in a few moments. I'm actually going to try and demonstrate, uh, demonstrate them to you, uh, a couple of them to you. Um, we hope that they are of interest. And I mean, uh, UNISA can, uh, people here at this, um, set of seminars can actually look at them and decide if they are of interest um, uh, because we've tried to make them quick. They are relatively quick to complete. If you want to know about open licensing, for example, you can go to one of these tutorials to, to, to check around it. Um, if you want to know about open access publishing, you can do the same sort of thing. And therefore, people can do these. They are online. No travel costs, uh, no time away from the classroom. But of course, you do have to have the access to the internet. And that's something that will come up a little later on. Um, it's important that you can 
to know that you can use them at their self-study at your own pace, or you can use them in a workshop environment. Um, and we hope also that each of these pathways delivers benefits that can be applied immediately in the professional work of the participating academics or to help to save them time. And um, Paul talked about where to find OER. We one of our learning pathways is, is finding open content. And uh, he said that everybody likes to show ways of finding it. Well, here's we've got a couple of tips in our finding open content pathway to quickly understand how best to be able to find open content. And that would hopefully be saving people time. Um, we developed the concept of these in 2019, and it's quite significant because even then we said we want people to do these online. And there was a big discussion in our team about that. Um, because it does, people said, well, maybe we should have them as PDFs uh, as well and offline versions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but we decided that online is clearly the future. And even if people don't have fantastic connectivity, um, hopefully that will improve over time. So we decided to keep them as um, online learning pathways. Um, but you'll note when I give you some findings of the pilot a little bit later on, there are some issues around that because we've we've um, we've not rolled these out at all, but we have piloted them uh, across five institutions uh, in Africa. Now, although we developed them in 2019, of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has meant that, as we all know, there are no longer for face to face workshops or very few or they're rather in, done in a particular way. So online CPD is actually very appropriate. We were going to pilot them last year by traveling to institutions and getting people to work with these pathways. In the end, we had to do all of our piloting online. It, and there was obviously a very fast learning curve there. OK, so that's what the, the, the website looks like. And um, there's the link. Uh, you will get this available as well. I haven't made it available on a URL, this presentation, but um, I'm sure Denzel will have a way of making all our presentations available. Um, OK, so that's what uh, the website looks like. And we so far we've worked on six of them. Um, uh, the first one is finding open content, um, as its name applies, but it's not just about OER, it's other content as well. So if people want to find other types of content, uh, they, can, they can go through this learning pathway. Very importantly, once you've found it and you've, um, you've, you've, you've evaluated it for yourself, you will want to adapt it. There's no doubt you will want to adapt it because you've got, you're going to have to change quite a lot of things. Um, to fit the context of, of, uh, of where you are working. So the second one is on adapting open content. And then we've got two on uh, design for learning. We are trying to um, promote the idea of activity-based learning of, um, of, uh, at, at higher education institutions and not just rely on people lecturing putting a talking head up online for people to listen to, and that is the only way for people to learn. They don't learn most effectively, as everybody knows. Uh, they don't learn from, from, from just listening to lectures. Um, so we've got uh, two learning pathways that are up there around, um, line, about, around how, to, how people learn and how we can design to get people to learn more effectively. Now, because we're working with higher education institutions, we decided to have um, at least uh, two or three learning pathways that are somewhat related to research, because although um, universities are obviously about teaching, they are also about research. So um, we've created a, a learning pathway called publishing through or via open access. So it explains what open access publishing is all about. And um, 
Those of you who have published an open access journal will know, you know how you go about doing that, but you will also know um, about the predatory publishers that all academics get emails from asking to publish your latest uh, work with almost no peer review in uh, a very dubious journal. So we've tried to cover that in that learning pathway as well. And this, uh, the sixth one is, um, again, for uh, academics who are publishing, how about communicating your research findings or your students' research findings, not just in a journal? You know how many people read journal articles, so when you've published something, yes, a few people will read it. Apparently, the, the people in the world who read the most journal articles are PhD students, because of course they've got to do a background in, uh, in, their own, in their own topic. But the vast majority of research findings just languish, as we always say, gathering dust. Uh, these days they languish in an online um, uh, journal. So um, we are trying to show different ways of communicating your research findings outside of academia. So those are the six that we've made available. They're all on the website. Um, and we have two in production. Uh, one of them, you'll be pleased to hear, talking about policy earlier, one of them is called Developing OER-Friendly Policies. So that's in production at the moment. We've also got one in production called Facilitating Online Learning, and then a more general one that we may be splitting up into sections is called Open Learning. And these are all standalone. They are standalone, self-study, accessed via the internet, and they can all run unfacilitated. But as I mentioned before, um, there are some issues around that. Uh, and we'll see those in a few minutes. OK, there are features. Now, this again, and keep referring to Paul's presentation because it certainly resonated. We used um, RISE for development. Now, if you want to buy a copy of RISE, you have to pay your thousands of rand. Um, and it, we, there was, again, a debate about doing that. Should we use a piece of commercial software to develop these learning pathways? And um, although we can, we can release them as OER out of RISE, but if you want to make changes to them, to the actual pathways, because they're because they're online and they're interactive, you would need to have RISE to, to make those changes. So that's a immediately jars against the idea of openness. Um, but we did it because we wanted to be able to make them relatively quickly without a specialist person. Because we wanted them to be interactive, as we'll show you with multimedia, etc. we didn't have necessarily access to a specialist who could do that for us in software that is not commercial. Um, I also know Paul's thing about, well, Word, everybody, lots, most people do have Word, but the further you go into Africa, the fewer people do have things like Microsoft Word. So in a way, Articulate Rise and Microsoft Office are on a continuum of, of commercial software, anyway. Um, they are completely open in that there's no login required. So uh, in other words, you don't need to register on the site to access them. So there's, they're open in that respect. You just go on there, you can start clicking and, and working with them. They, are, it can be open, they can be accessed from the OER Africa website, or we are giving them away. We can export them, um, and then you can put, your, can put them on your own server. So where people want to um, have them on an intranet, so that people don't need to use data to access them. Um, that is uh, a, a one possibility. Um, the idea behind them is that they're accessible, they're useful to people, they're relevant to people. We try to make them interactive. We've tried not to put too much text in them. We've used videos, we've used animations, and we've used machine-generated feedback. So those ideas are to try and make them attractive to people to, to access. So um, I'm now just going to do a, a, a quick demonstration uh, of two of them, just to give you a feel of what they look like.
and then I'll take a few questions on those if, if people have any, and then I'll move on to what we found from, from the piloting and what the, and what the future is. So let me um, get out of there and go to here. And Denzel, maybe you can tell me, can you see that screen still? Uh, yes. Learning pathways. Yes. OK, so it's now good. we're on the OER Africa website. Um, and all six of them are there finding open content. We also have a Spanish version. Somebody wanted a Spanish version and they offered to translate it for us. Um, I think somebody in South America. So it's been translated into Spanish. Obviously, we'd have in a way preferred uh, Portuguese if we're going to go for that way, but um, there's a Spanish version. There's adapting open content, publishing using open access, design for learning, um, and um, communicate research findings. So I'm just going to go to finding open content and hoping it's going to work for me. Um, OK, so this is it in. Um, in. Uh, the, this is what it looks like. There's the summary of it. The sum is very small. You won't be able to see it, but I just want to demonstrate it to you. You start the course here. And quite usefully, down the left hand side are all the sections of it. So you can jump from section to section if you like. We've started where, with a graphic of where we are going. We have um, open licensing, open content, open search, how to evaluate briefly, and then a summary. And then we have a set of objectives for each of the main sections. And Basically, this interface is just means you just click to move on. So I go to the bottom of the screen and I click and I move on. Now, um, we've tried to do it, have each one in a similar style. We ask people a question. We give them some, uh, some, uh, 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 some information in form of text, and then we put on a video. Um, these are these are various videos that we are using here, um, and some of them are more appropriate, some of them are less appropriate, but they are all OER. So um, I don't know how well um, this uh, Teams allows you to hear what's on there. So you can see it resonates with what Paul was talking about. So that's just an example. We have a video. We then have a bit more text explaining a little bit about that. And then we have a continue button. And basically, this scrolls up and scrolls up. As you move through it, you will see that uh, you can see which sections you have finished. Um, and we ask questions. Do you know how to find OER? Where would you start? And then we give some feedback in a reveal box. And it talks about. Uh, a little bit about the Creative Commons, etc. And then we move on. We move further on. Explains open licensing. We ask people to think. We have a video about Creative Commons. I won't play that right now. And then we go through the licenses. So this is obviously familiar because our previous speaker was doing that. We have a, um, a summary of them here. And then if you want to read about each one, uh, you, it's a reveal again, explains with examples each of these um, licenses. So here's a, here's a more complex one. And it gives examples again, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how um, the licensing section is. 
Now, we, um, sorry, we haven't quite finished this. Um, we explain what Creative Commons is all about. There's another YouTube video about Creative Commons. And we ask people to reflect again. Um, and there's feedback on their reflection. We give them feedback on their reflection. Now, we now do a quiz and we actually ask people to, if they, what do you think they learned from that Creative Commons license um, section? So we have, we start the quiz and it's basically a multiple choice. What can you do, you might not be able to read this, with MIT's open courseware? And then there are options to click. And it shows the license there. So if you were paying attention in the licensing section, you should try and think back to that to, to answer these questions. And I will just do one at random. Um, I'm actually going to not do one at random. I'm going to do a wrong answer. OK, I click it and then I submit. And it tells me that I was wrong and it gives me some feedback. OK, so I won't go through that, but it's a quiz on Creative Commons licensing. I'm now jumping ahead to the next section. In fact, um, I'm going to jump ahead to the uh, open the Google section. So we're trying to get people to be more efficient about searching. So we have um, an explanation of how to use the Google advanced search to find open content. And we have an explanation of it, and there's a small video to explain how to do it. We have a similar one for YouTube. How to search for open content on YouTube. And um, uh, what is the process and the, the YouTube filters that you use so I'm not obviously I'm just doing this as a demonstration. I'm not going through all the details for you. Um, I'm jumping ahead. Um, we then have a small assignment for people if they want to uh, to work, if they want to try and build up what they have been doing in their as they've been going through their um, their tutorials, and we ask them to to do that. Now we can't. Actually, we don't submit that anywhere. We can't send it anywhere um, at the moment. We don't have a process for that. But um, we, uh, some institutions are putting this learning pathway onto a Moodle. And then within their Moodle, they're allowing people to submit the assignment. And then we have a summary near the end explaining it what it's all about. And finally, we have the attribution and references and all our attribution of what other CC works we've used, the reference list and uh, the license for this particular. Um, for this learning pathway. OK, so. Um, that is the first one. I'm just going to now spend a, a shorter time going through Publish Open Access, just to give you an indication of what it looks like. And then if people have got any questions, they are welcome to ask. So this one's about, it's not about OER, it's about Open Access. It follows the same sort of format, a graphic, the outcomes, uh, and then we can move on to what is Open Access Publishing. We've got a video, an activity, and we ask, very simple, which card shows the correct logo for open access? So if you click it, that is the one for open access. If you clicked on that one, it's for open data, et cetera, et cetera. We are getting people to, why should they consider open access? And we get them to look at this graphic. And again, there's a little activity and this particular activity is you're meant to choose. You say that and you can put that there. It's like a, and then it shows you are correct. Practitioners can apply your findings. Because there, it's wrong. 
So practitioners go to there and it's correct, etc. So um, the final bit of this I will show is how to choose a reputable open access journal. So we explain what they are. There's a very useful little video called Think, Check and Submit. And we then give people guidelines about the journals that they might consider publishing in that are open access. OK, so I'm going to um, stop that particular uh, demonstration here. And I'm going to uh, stop for a moment and ask if anybody's got any questions. Uh, thanks, colleagues. Your, your mics are now open to be unmute. You're welcome to raise your hand and, and pose a question to Tony for any clarity. Doesn't look like there are. I think the colleagues are good, Tony. Maybe we can continue. While colleagues, colleagues, if you want to pose a question, you can also just post your comment question in the comments tab or the chat room, and we'll pose it to Tony at the end of the session. Maybe I can I can pose a question to, <laughs> to of my own to, <laughs> to Paul, um, just to think about, and maybe we could discuss it at the end. Um, Paul said that no derivatives uh, licenses are really not OER, but um, no derivatives licenses are quite useful when people want to publish their work open access so now people don't have to necessarily pay to access it but of course the researcher does not want people to change the findings change the uh change the actual content of their research paper so that's an area that's an area that we found we think that um, no derivatives can be useful if it moves towards open access rather than OER. So I don't know if um, Paul would like to maybe comment on that a little later. I okay. I'm here and still away, can't I? Do you think <laughs> I should answer? Sorry? Shall I go ahead and answer, Denzel? Yeah, what? Yeah, what? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm okay with you answering it now. Um, I think that the ND can be very useful. Um, I think that um, you pose a good suggestion, especially in an article, you don't want to change the article, but a person using it might still reference it and, and cite it much as you do any copyrighted article. So um, I don't think there's a problem with that. And if you wanted to rework that article, then you would need to send an email to the author and say, I mm. like your article, but I need to modify it a bit. So mm. all of those options are still there, but it's not an OER. Yeah. It's okay. useful. Exactly. So you could create an OER around the article, which Absolutely. is fixed, and you could create some sort of educational resource to interrogate the article, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Denzel, if that's okay, as I asked a question of myself, um, can, should we move on? Y yes, uh, Tony, I think so. Thanks. OK, so um, we went through a piloting process for those. Um, in fact, we only did the first three, uh, the first three that we created. We um, we piloted finding open content, adapting open content and publish open access because those were the first three we created. Um, firstly, we did uh, a peer review. We did expert testing. We sent them to people. And um, one of the nice features of RISE is that you can do a review copy and people can write on it and review it as they go through it. So we did that and then of course we revised. Each of the learning pathways was then revised as a result of the of the expert testing. We then um, got advice from um, the, Af the Association of African Universities and the African Librarians Association to identify potential institutions to pilot 
And in the end, we used five institutions across uh, different, five different countries. We had 78 academics working through them, and they completed pre and post surveys, uh, tests, if you like. And there was, sorry, post user discussion or post use discussion after they'd gone through it. We then asked them some questions about how they had found it. And um, as a result of that piloting, we then made further revisions um, to, to the learning pathways. The nice thing is whenever we see something um, that is relevant, we can actually just go into RISE and make a change immediately to the, to the learning pathway. Um, we would then have to re-upload it to OER Africa for everybody else to have um, the new version. So what did we find? Um, we find people said that they liked their sequence. Um, they liked the sim the, the sim their simplicity and straightforwardness. They liked that interface, the one I showed you, friendly and interactive. These are some of their comments. Um, there were knowledge gains. We did a, like a pre-test and a post-test. They learned about searching for OER, they learned about the, um, the, the licensing of OER and they learned about adapting OER. So they certain, there was certainly some knowledge gain there. And um, they did like the multimedia incorporated as well as the reflection exercises. So with the reflection exercises, we tried to say, right, read the question, stop and think about it and then have a look at our feedback. Um, they also found Navigation was straightforward. As I showed you, you can go down the left-hand side and jump, or you can just go through straight through the, the whole uh, set of tutorials. Um, people who were not well-versed in open access, they, they were interested in it. They, they found it useful. Um, and people found particularly useful was how to choose a good journal, a, a good open access journal. Um, there was only a slight knowledge improvement compared with the find open content and adapt. Um, after doing the publish open access, there was only a slight knowledge improvement. Um, and we attribute this to the fact that most of the people who did the publish open access learning pathway were librarians. So most of them were already aware of open access, um, open access publishing. Um, we find that most uh, academics, um, lecturers are, are less aware, but not so many of them have completed the publish open access pathway. There are, of course, some challenges. Um, people took about two hours to complete it, uh, each one. Um, and when we asked people to do this, uh, we said, well, which one would you like to do? And they said, oh, we'll do all three. But the reality was that people if it takes you two hours to complete or more, um, in a way, that's enough. They also found they didn't know how long they were going to spend on each section. So although there's that little, on the left-hand side, that little wheel that shows how much you've completed, that's not necessarily a time thing. So this is something we're going to, we're, we actually got a, a, a revision meeting next week, a meeting to think through these things uh, to try and ensure that the future ones are better. And that's one of the areas we need to consider, the idea of something to do with timing. Um, staff, even though they were volunteers, they did say that if we're going to complete these sorts of things, we need some sort of incentive. Now, those of you who are in academic development and in the area of um, professional development for academics, um, know that people often want extrinsic motivation and uh, the idea of incentives. So we're suggesting that these, if people are going to pull these into some sort of professional development, um, uh, let's say ecosystem for staff in an institution, there is some form of incentivization. I'll talk about that towards the end. Um, we said navigation was fine earlier, but as soon as you get network issues or poor connectivity, na navigation became an issue. People found they could not get the video to run 
Whereas when you've got a good connection, it runs no problem. So when there is poor connectivity, there is a bit of a problem. And that's an area in a way out of our control. Um, but obviously we want to make sure a video is short. We, it's brief and it hopefully can be can get loaded quite quickly. Um, we are um, looking into ways to make sure of that. But we also we never have any long videos. I think the longest ones maximum is five minutes. Further challenges, because we were working COVID uh, times last year, a lot of the academics were working from home and they were having to pay for their own data. So that this wouldn't apply, obviously, if you're accessing it in your institution. Um, also, if you have a break from it, you're halfway through. If you leave it open, then it will show you where you were. But if you completely close the program, switch the computer off, come back the next day, it does not take you back to the same place. So that's something else we need to consider if we can, uh, if we can um, work with. It's partly a rise thing. Um, an interesting thing is that I talked about right at the beginning, people find it difficult to do self-study online. They want these things facilitated. And we had a conversation with the affiliate people yesterday who were saying we would like to run workshops for people um, in Nigeria and something else. And then, you know, we said, yes, well, workshops are fine, but um, are you going to really reach everybody? In Nigeria, there are over 400 universities. If you want to go to scale, you need some balance. And I'll bring I'll come back to that right at the end. People like facilitation, no doubt about it. And the other thing is that people would work on it, but then they got distracted by their commitments. And this is a feature of distance learning, if you like, and online learning. But I think it's probably worse in online distance learning. If you sit, if you, if you think of the old correspondence courses, you take your workbook, you go and sit in a corner and you work on it, maybe with a reader. But online learning means that, oh, what pops up here? A Facebook thing or a, a, a Twitter account or um, a WhatsApp and people get distracted. So we need to think through how these sorts of things that we're trying to develop can work in the online environment without people getting too distracted. OK, so what's the way forward? Um, we haven't created these things just as an end in themselves. The idea is that they form a, a part of professional development and capacity building strategies in, in, in institutions. And um, we are looking into, we're trying to help both AAU and possibly AFLIA with helping them to help institutions think through CPD strategies from themselves. And the first thing is that we, the pandemic shows that we need flexible methods of delivering programs. It, it, we can't just go back. The old thing of running workshops for people is, is not likely to be the future all by itself. They might happen but um, we need flexible methods. Um, we need to diversify the activities and those methods. Um, and we also need to make sure that any CPD just moves away from compliance towards actual real professional development. We want to make sure that is it's true professional development and not just being able to fill in forms or something for ethics clearance for um, for research or something like that. Um, we would like institutions to think through um, diverse, structured, evidence based programs of, of, of CPD, both in from an institutional point of view and personal individuals in areas that the institution thinks are key. 
Um, we do need to link them to incentives. So there should be some method of linking good PD to some form of incentive. We're not suggesting exactly. We'll probably, as we develop our own strategy, talk about what those might be, but we haven't yet. And the idea also, we really will have to develop some form of communities of practice, uh, PLCs, professional learning communities, virtual networks, those are also going to be important. So that's where these learning pathways are leading towards. They are an alternative way of learning about stuff, but we're having to think through the actual learning, online learning aspects of them. OK, so um, finally, I've got a couple of uh, concluding remarks. I've stressed this throughout. Going forward, it cannot be professional development cannot be business as usual. We've got to think through a balance between large scale rollout, because this is in the end what this is about. If we've got a billion people in Africa and we've got 400, in, um, uh, 400 universities in Nigeria, and I don't know how many in uh, Ethiopia and other countries, we do need to have large scale rollout. We can't just go there and run a workshop for two or three institutions and go away again. So there's got to be a balance between large scale rollout and it, that probably has to involve self-study CPD versus the facilitated workshops. And that's what we're actually going to be grappling with with um, AFLIA this year. They, we're sort of looking at semi-facilitation. How can we do semi-facilitation? Not a full facilitated workshop, but some self-study and some facilitation to assist them. And finally, how do we make this self-study online learning more acceptable? Um, distance learning, as UNISA well knows, is completely acceptable. Um, but the idea of, of, of online learning is um, is, is, is difficult. And yes, we can. We're reading much more on uh, tablets and phones and stuff. Um, but what are we reading? And to what extent are we learning and not being distracted by all those other things that we get distracted by? So um, that's it for my presentation. And it does have a CC BY license. We'll be giving uh, this presentation to Denzel for everybody to access if they would like. So um, I can end the show and I can. No, I can't see my Microsoft Teams thing. Oh, here it is. I'm not very used to Teams, I'm afraid. OK, thank okay. you. Th thanks, Tony. I think uh, uh, the first parts were quite interesting because it opened up a new space for us to really think about professional development in the university. Uh, but the latter parts as well, it actually forced us to uh, to respond to the COVID. Our COVID actually challenged the way we do uh, the way we do university generally. I mean, it's yes. a complete shift. Yes. Uh, but as well, I, you know, I, I like the, the the latter two points of scalability as well as communities of practice and network. Uh, it's a shared, it's a shared knowledge space, shared expertise space, uh, and I think this this actually forces us to rethink uh, that uh, even while UNISA may be uh, the distance learning university, uh, and we always pride ourselves with this distinct, we're not so distinct because there are other universities that are now being compelled to move into a similar situation as well uh, by COVID, uh, and as a result. It means that we need to rethink a lot of the ways we strategize, and this means professional development enhancements. So it actually forces us to rethink a lot of the elements that we have in place. Yeah. Uh, colleagues, I want to open up for 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 discussions um, so that you can post your questions. But I think, uh, yeah, from, from my side, Tony, I think you've raised some really critical points in that last slide, that concluding slides actually captured <laughs> it quite well. Uh, the driving forces that we need to think of in the institution, whether it is uh, residential universities, whether it is uh, uh, online universities, those are the type of discussions that we are all uh, kind mm. of engaging with. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and it's quite, yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks for that. So colleagues, uh, let me open up the platform for discussions. Uh, I also want to read some of, um, okay, there's, 
Yes, there's a, okay, so let me, so a lot of people are very positive about the presentation. Uh, Chakawira says, you know, I guess it depends, uh, e-learning not appropriate for all training content. Uh, I think that covers your point, uh, Tony, that maybe, and, and it also goes well to the point that uh, Dr. Salosh Govinder raised as well, is that, uh, is, is that maybe we need to think of, a, and the point you raised, a semi-approach towards how we build capacity so that you have the online learning plus the webinars. Uh, yeah, so that kind of approach, I think that's quite critical of the type of content that we train and how we present these workshops. Uh, Okay, so I just want to go higher up to see what else we've got here. Uh, I don't know if, uh, Salosh, if you want to pick up on any of your questions that you've raised here, your points. Salosh, Governor, Salosh. Okay, I think she's off. Um, yeah, while Salosh is coming on, I think she may have a network challenge. Uh, the, the one point, uh, Tony, that, I, that came up for me in the presentation, uh, is the colleagues were posting up comments that the, the online session seems to be attracting more people than the physical workshop sessions. And I think that a large mm. part of this is the flexibility of the environment. Uh, but also uh, what I've noticed in these sessions that we host as well is the synchronous and asynchronous opportunities. Uh, is that uh, colleagues can jump in and also watch the recordings thereafter, mm. which creates this more enhanced type of nuanced engagement for, for training and development. Uh, which yeah. also then cross over to the academic space as well. Um, there's a question here by Jane. I'm wondering how effective Teams Meeting is as an online learning platform. Uh, online platforms, uh, Tony, from your side, uh, Sadie used, uh, do you use Zoom quite often? Yes, we use, um, I, I'm not so familiar with uh, Teams. I've used it. The first time I used it um, uh, to actually present uh, was not that long ago, and my stupid Apple Mac needed some setting changed if I wanted to share my screen. Um, so I, <laughs> I then had to change the setting, get out of the meeting, go back in again. So there are some little glitches like that. Um, we we use Zoom. None of them are perfect. I mean, they, they all have their pros and cons. Um, the, the thing that I find is that with everybody's m microphones muted and their, and their cameras off, it becomes very impersonal, obviously. Um, you know, even with a, even if you have a lecture hall full of, you know, about, I don't know, several hundred students or something like that, you can see people, what they're doing, and you can walk around and you can do stuff, and you can even get them to interact. And there, there is scope for that in some of these online um, platforms. You can put people into um, breakaway rooms and stuff like that. Um, it does have to be quite well managed, and you usually need an additional person um, to, to help you. So whereas I could go to, in the past, go to Nigeria and run a, what I thought was a workshop for 30 people, and there were 80 people there, and so we manage it. That's fine. Um, but then I did that by myself. Uh, you know, you do it. You do those sorts of things alone. But when, you're, when you want to do a good, a really good Teams or, or Zoom presentation, you really need someone in the background to be checking, uh, especially when it's uh, you're teaching something, to be checking the questions, because as you well know, it's very difficult to, to look at the chat at the same time as do the presentation. So you do need an additional person or more to, to help you do, do those sorts of things. So um, it, you know, it takes a bit of extra person power to do so. But they, they have potential, and I'm sure they'll they will improve over time. If you think about it, they've only be we've only been really. I've used Zoom for several years, but I um, mean, <laughs> suddenly it was you know it really took off uh, last year. So yeah, yeah. Um, they're they're not I don't they're not ideal. And really to say, if we if we are asked to run a workshop for thirty people, I think a, a more effective workshop is a face to face workshop. But if we're asked to run a workshop for 300 people or 2,000 people, obviously, um, this is the way to go. Mm. Yeah, I think the, the scalability issue, but I, I, the point that you raise on the personal and the impersonal nature of some of these workshops that we have uh, is quite an interesting point when it comes to technology. Uh, but also the uh, the head that a lot of these tools, uh, Zoom, et cetera, weren't designed for this type of, of no. engagement. No. Uh, so it was thrown into the deep end and adapted. Uh, but it also meant, and I think this is quite interesting, 
is that uh, it, it means that we now need to develop the digital competencies of the staff as well uh, to engage in these type of platforms that we are now using. So there's a, there's a development beside the fact of that we're using the platforms to deliver. There's also a development uh, that is needed to train our staff on the actual tools that we are using to deliver yes, these type yes. of training. Yes. So I think that's a twofold competencies level that we need to. Uh, there's a point here. Another option when presenting alone is to use two screens so that the other screen is open for the platform, while on the other screen you operate the presentation. Yes, I think that's a that's an important point as well. Sure. So it's a matter of how we use the facilities. Uh, so you know, the academics can identify their own learning needs and select a learning pathway that best suits them. Uh, and I think that uh, Salosh, do you want to expand on that part? I see you're you you're able to to engage now. Thank you, Denzel. Colleagues, uh, this point, uh, what, I, what I actually meant is that um, there should be a series or a number of uh, courses in this learning pathway and academics can, you know, choose or select the one that best suits them. They are not forced to do something that, you know, they, they don't want to really do. And for me, this is this is a huge benefit. And um, can I just share uh, an example of one of the MOOCs that we have written for this project, uh, Tony? We've yeah. written a MOOC on um, online assessment, for example, and it, you know there's a series of MOOCs that we have written that contributes towards uh, getting into groups with online assessment. And what we tried to uh, include here is activities or practice exercises where academics can actually transform or improve their own module that they are currently teaching. And so those practice exercises uh, are linked to their, uh, you know, to the module that they're currently teaching so that they can transform and improve on their own practices. Right. Sounds good. Yeah, I think that's an important point, Salosh, that you raised, uh, and the idea of how we're using these open spaces to engage with them. Uh, I see Richard as an interesting question. I think that's quite an important question, specifically uh, when we're talking about artificial intelligence and the, and the uh, 4IR uh, developments. Uh, Richard, do you want to pose your question? Yes, I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned <coughs> that workshops is still uh, something that's heavily sought after. Has they been tested yet to use bots or virtual teaching assistants that can actually interact with the student as they perhaps do it online? So it almost feels like you part of a virtual classroom, but it's almost like a one on one teaching assistant and then the courses can even adjust as per the questions that's being received and provided uh, what course material is presented next. So it's always adjusting to the person that's actually doing the course. So it's just a lot mm. more interactive. So almost just a new way of uh, redefining workshops for online space instead of just the traditional blended. You've got the online and traditional workshops. Yeah. Very interesting question. I'm not aware, but it's uh, it's it's definitely a way to go, especially if you can uh, you can interact directly with people um, in that in that way. You could set something up to do such a thing. That would be really great. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Uh, and I think it's also a matter of us rethinking of how we customize. It it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> 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 to customize our learning experiences. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. I think you've given us. Uh, uh, let me see if there's any question. That's one question that came up. Uh, we'll give the person an opportunity. Uh, Suri, do you want to raise your question? Uh, thank you, Denzel. And thank you very much, Tony, for this very enlightening session. I think it's always learning more the more you listen to the different spaces and ideas. I'm just wanting to ask Denzel, you know, we used to have the live streaming sessions that were organized by Prof, uh, uh, Prof, Professor Dani Duplessis. And there we use Zoom, like the previous speakers, I mean, uh, one of the chats said, two platforms. The Zoom is where we do the presentations and he linked us on join the students on join in and there is where the chat happened with lecturers or colleagues who addressed queries as the presentation was done but i'm not sure, so sure where this directive is going now in terms of constraints and new developments i'm not sure thanks uh, sorry uh, i think the the streaming services has moved to the multimedia center 
which collaborates with with Prof Dami's unit as well, uh, and they are situated in the B block uh, with the with the under the acting director uh, Kanisile Tabu. Uh, so she's actually a very influential person, good to work with as well. But may, I may also steal this opportunity to say that uh, while Prof Matuana and Prof Mashira are here, we will be soon launching. Um, a, a separate studio, a mini studio called Extron. Uh, it's similar to the one button studio, but a much more advanced studio called Extron. Uh, it allows you as an individual lecturer to walk into a mini studio, uh, either plug in your USB, uh, tape a recording, and go back to your, to your desk and plug it onto the LMS or share it on YouTube. But it also allows the functionality to stream directly onto YouTube, onto Facebook as well. So you can actually do live streams as well. The idea of this mini studio that uh, Prof. Mashile and Prof. Matuwane wanted was the flexibility to give academics uh, the ability to engage uh, through these type of streaming opportunities, through this type of production uh, at their own uh, time. So we don't need to go through the process of booking up studio time uh, as we did before in the uh, with the multimedia. It gives you that flexibility to walk into these spaces and engage. So this is something that we're now putting up. Uh, by the end of next week, we will secure uh, the provider with the idea that by first week, March, second week, March, we would like to launch that uh, the mini studio as part of this adult series as well. Uh, so keep an eye on that, uh, Suri and colleagues. But that is something definitely that will propel us more into the multimedia stream of streaming, etc. But give you the academic, you the support stuff, the option, uh, the, the power to use it into your own hands and how you want to use that. So that's something that we're trying to uh, push as Unis. And I think that will be uh, give you as the academics a good opportunity to innovate your curriculum. Thank so you, Denzel. Thank, you, oh, thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much um, for your question. Uh, thank you, Tony. Let me quickly thank you, Tony, for your session. I think your session you. opened up a lot of opportunities for us to engage further. But you also brought some of those national trends, some of those international trends, and the work that you're doing at Sadie as well, which was quite impressive in terms of how you customize the learning sites. And I think that's something that we can learn from as as Eunice as well. So thank you very much, Tony. And I know thank we you. came last month to you, but you managed to make time for that. And, and we know we've got some future collaborations to engage with you and Sadie as well. So definitely. So thank you very much, so, uh, Tony, and we appreciate your time with us. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Colleagues, I'm just going to give you a two minute break as we uh, did before your coffee or body break. And we will then move, uh, give Prof. Matuani the opportunity to settle in and uh, get a screen sorted out. And then we will uh, start. So you got two minutes uh, and we will start on time. So it's 12.05 by 12.07 we will start. Uh, and we will have Prof. Matuani with us and I will introduce her. She needs no introduction, but I'll introduce her when we come back. Thank you. Two minutes, colleagues.
Okay, thank you, colleagues. We are back. And for our last session, uh, our last session is entitled Rethinking Academic Development in an Era of Crisis and Innovation. And I think this picks up quite beautifully with the two first sessions. And our speaker today is Professor Matuane, and she needs no introduction because she is from UNISA. We all know her quite well. But since she's left UNISA and gone to UK, then now gives me an opportunity to introduce her from outside. Prof. Matuane holds a dealer at Phil in Psychology from the University of South Africa. She is a registered clinical psychologist and currently the Dean and Head of School of Applied Human Sciences at the University of KwaZulu Natal. She previously served as the Director, Instructional Support and Services at the University of South Africa, a position occupied from 2012 to 2020. In this position, she facilitated the design, development, and implementation of quality assurance mechanisms for effective instructional support. Her research interests include the exploration of innovative practices that are aimed at increasing access into higher education within developing countries. A recent postgraduate certificate in online learning qualification from Oldenburg University in Germany exemplifies her appetite for lifelong learning. Prof. Matuane. Also, as uh, she's familiar with the UNISA context, she brings together a national and international experiences to this, to this particular forum. And it now gives us an opportunity to say, welcome back to UNISA, Prof. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, colleagues. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Denzel, for the introduction, and thank you too for the invitation to come and make this presentation. Uh, colleagues, let me just take you through the overview of my presentation. I'm going to give a bit of background to my talk. I will then try and very briefly look at some of the global trends and drivers of change in higher education. I had meant to also revisit the UNISA academic development framework, but I saw in the introduction and welcome by Prof. Mashile that he, he, he made reference to this. So I'm not going to say much there then. And then I will then uh, look at capacity development uh, innovations, uh, reflections and thoughts. And primarily, um, with my presentation, um, I just want to, I know that UNISA has done quite a lot uh, around the issue of academic development. And um, my, my presentation is really just about uh, sharing some thoughts, some ideas and getting us to, to reflect on these and, and, and see how applicable this can be within the context of UNISA. And so when I was given the topic, I, 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 I looked at, I zoomed in on the word crisis, and, and then I linked that to what COVID-19 brought to us all within the higher education space. And the, the, the metaphor that came to my mind was that of trying to fly an aeroplane whilst it's still in construction. And, and, and that metaphor then uh, uh, resonated for me with the whole notion of having to switch remotely, working remotely, and in some instances, or in fact, none of us were prepared for doing that. And, and, and when I looked at the issue of having to switch remotely, uh, I thought about three elements and, 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 and linking them to this metaphor. The first element was the structural component of the aeroplane. Um, what brought to my mind was the fact that if the aeroplane is flying, but it's still under construction, then it means there are certain structural elements that are existing that allows this flight uh, aeroplane to fly. What also came to mind was looking at the different role players within this aeroplane and the, 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 the system of flying. There are engineers who are busy putting these structural elements together. There are flight attendants who have to make sure that uh, passengers are able to get onto the flight and fly and serve them. The, the, there's your pilot, there's your, your, your uh, um, uh, flight attendants that are also assisting. 
There's also passengers on the other hand, but then there are also other role players that are in the background that we may not be aware of, but that are influencing how that aeroplane is flying, like your air traffic controllers. We don't, we don't quite often see them, but they are visible, they are, they are out there. And, and you've got your air, airports company management that are busy with uh, taking charge of what happens at, at a higher level, at a strategic level. Those are the other role players that we are not able to see. And then there's the element of the operational side, where now it's, it's how, how things are happening. As I book a flight, there are mechanisms for us to book flights. There are time frames, uh, flight schedules. There are, there are rules in terms of when you can board your flight, when you can check in your luggage, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and when I thought about this, I, I, I could not help but um, put it alongside what happens in, in, in education, in higher education for that matter. When you look at the higher education space, you, if we look at the structural component, we, we've got our different university types, your, your face to face, your online, your distance education. You've got your programs that have to be put in place. Those are your structural component. You've got the, 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 the modes of, of, of a, a, a delivery of your programs. Your role players would be your students, would be your, 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 your instructional designers, would be your, your management, would be yeah, your, your lecturers, all, all those. And then you've got your operational side, um, the, the day to day teaching that happens, the transaction between the students and the, the, the institution uh, um, at registration point, at support services, at the actual teaching and learning. And, and so um, when I, I thought about that metaphor, about a, a, a plane that is flying but still under construction, I, I recognized the fact that there are two sides to, to this whole process. There's an unfinished product, there's a finished product. We, we, when we, we are working remotely, um, as is currently happening, the, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of an anticipation of a finished product. But then currently, it, it's questionable whether, whether that product is indeed finished. Because when, when we look at how we had to hit the ground running last year, the issue was there were a lot of issues for, for different uh, institutions. Some had to contend with having to switch online when they had no skills to actually start teaching online when their material that they are teaching the students was not prepared for online learning in the first place. And so they had to try and patch things as they moved along. Now, the first apologies, apologies, Prof. Uh, sorry, just can you can you just move your slides? I think it's a bit stuck. How do I move them? Are you not able to see them? No, it's stuck on the first slide. Is it? Uh... Can you see it now? I don't know what to do now, Denzel. Okay. Should if I give you, you? Should I give you control? Uh. Okay. Maybe. Let okay, me send you. Maybe, the, okay. If you send me the presentation, then and I can. Because I don't. Or if you just reduce, if you it, may, it might be easier if you just uh exit the screen, uh, close the screen, and then just share your screen directly from your desktop, even if it's not in PowerPoint, if it's not in presentation mode. I've just sent you the presentation and I'll give you control. Do you have it now, Denzel? Uh, it's not yet, it has not yet come through. Let me just see, as soon as it comes through, I'll share. Okay, maybe you can. Can I continue? Yes. Yeah, okay, maybe continue. As soon as it comes through, I'll share it on my side. Okay. Um, and then the issue then also is around uncertainty and certainty. Um, we, we, we're flying this, this, this plane, but we're not quite sure whether all the parts are in place, and we're not sure whether we are going to deliver a, a quality product. But then at the same time, there is pressure that 
you have to get to the end. And we know the, the call from higher education for us to try and se secure the, the academic year and make sure that we are done. And, and so um, I then had a few questions that, 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 that came to my mind as I thought about this issue. And, and, and um, looking at the, the very notion of higher education as a space within which we navigate, um, oftentimes when we, we, we hire uh, lecturers, it's very rare where you find that academics are, are, are hired because of their expertise in teaching. Oftentimes we hire them for their expertise as, 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 as a subject specialists as discipline experts. And, and therefore, um, I see that metaphor still playing itself, even in that space. And, and I wondered whether um, the, 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 the metaphor of a flying aeroplane and, and us working on it whilst it's flying is not something that is a, a norm within the higher education space. That's, that's the question that I asked myself. And then I, I started having three questions that I want to, to, to ask. The first one is, how adequate um, is our Odell knowledge base if we look at the context of UNISA? Um, how equipped are we for teaching and learning in an Odell environment? And I say teaching and learning because I'm now looking at both the side of the lecturers and the side of the students. And then the last question is, which I think is very important, what is our level of personal insight into our knowledge gap and skills deficit? Looking at the first two questions and looking at the very context of, of higher education. And so if I move then to the next slide, um, I just wanted us to remind ourselves, I know that we are aware of this, just to remind ourselves about um, open distance e-learning or slash technology enhanced learning. I'm going to interchange those two. Um, and, and, and if we look at the, the, the nature and character of technology enhanced learning, it's interactive by nature. We, we, we cannot um, take material that was meant for face-to-face -face classroom or for print-based teaching and transport it as it is onto the online space. It has to, to have that element of interaction. I saw earlier on with the previous presentation, there was a question around how collaborative are the CPD training programs. It, it, the element of collaboration becomes very important because peer learning, it's, it's, it's very critical within the space. The, the, the kind of material that we develop has to be highly engaging. It, it's multidimensional as well. Now, if we look at the, 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 the right side, there are as challenges that are associated with this kind of, 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 of teaching material. And, and maybe I put challenges as a question, perhaps it's actually opportunities for, for, for professional development. Um, um, we see now as we begin to move towards technology enhanced learning that we introduce the notion of a learner's role being completely different from the learner who would be taught in class or who would be sent study material. The role of the lecturer also changes completely. They, they, they do not uh, become the, the, the expert in knowledge, but they take on a totally different role, maybe of facilitation, maybe of linking students with one another. There's also the, 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 the notion of having to integrate technology into your teaching. Do we all have that competency as, as academics, as students? Are we able to, to use the tool that is presented to us to, to, to use for learning? We, we, we also need to look at the most critical element also of online learning or technology enhanced learning, improving interaction and communication because it becomes a very critical and central issue in online learning. And when I was listening to uh, the previous speaker, uh, Tony, talking about um, how, how online learning can be a distractor, uh, uh, the issue perhaps could be, do we indeed have the competencies or the, the know-how of structuring online programs such that we, 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 we try and deal with some of those distractors, some of those 
uh, uh, issues that minimize the, the presentation. And so um, I, I, I then move on. Those were just uh, uh, issues that I wanted us to, 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 to reflect on, maybe, maybe remind ourselves of. And then I now move on to uh, the key trends in accelerating technology adoption in higher education. And I, I'm going to base this uh, primarily on the EDUCOS report um, as reflected in Alexandra's um, report on, on um, some of the trends that show um, how different people are using, um, uh, are, are trying to accelerate the use of technology within their different spaces. Uh, the first one is the, the trend that is emerging is redesigning learning spaces. And there it's, it's primarily looking at issues of active learning classrooms, creating active learning classrooms and also creating collaborative learning spaces. Um, and then if we look at the second one, which is a blended learning design, there are some who might argue that a blended learning design is a foregone conclusion. However, there are others who are also arguing that it is how innovative you make those blended learning designs that actually qualify them to become trends. Um, and then the third observable trend is that of advancing cultures of innovation. And here, um, some of the trends that are being uh, uh, cited are creating venture labs, creating incubators, or in, in general, just uh, having partnerships with business of outside of the education space and creating opportunities for students to have work-based learning um, through uh, online platforms. And then um, the next trend is that of growing focus on measuring learning. I think um, at UNISA, um, when I left, I know that this is one of the issues that um, the institution was grappling with, uh, trying to, to look at how do we measure uh, students' academic readiness? How do we measure students' uh, progression into the system? Uh, the use of, of data analytics, learning analytics, to be able to try and uh, support student success. And, and here the question in, in most of the literature is that we need to make a distinction between student engagement and student assessment, that the two are not the same they are separate. And therefore, when we talk about um, accelerating technology adoption, we need to look at how do we then um, um, in, uh, um, implement those, how do we design those. And then um, the other uh, trend is that of rethinking how institutions work. And here in particular, um, it's prioritizing what workers need. We know how uh, the, the rate of unemployment in South Africa is and even amongst um, graduates. Perhaps the question is, are our graduates uh, having the necessary skills for the job market? Are they ready to plunge in and work? Well, in the, in the era of COVID-19, that's another issue, but, but, but um, that, that remains the question. Our, our, our skills, are they, uh, do they uh, uh, possess the skills that allow them to go freely and, and, and uh, plunge into the work market? And then the last trend is that of uh, modularized and disaggregated degrees. And I think um, the first speaker touched a bit on this, the issue of, of micro-credentialing. It's beginning uh, uh, to be a trend that is emerging um, in, 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 in accelerating the adoption of technology. MOOCs, I think maybe the Monday sessions spoke about that, uh, digital badges also. Um, and this actually gives learners control over their learning path. Uh, we just heard about learning pathways that are being created from, from SID. Um, and then let's move on to the next one where I've just moved away from the, from the key trends and I'm now looking at some of the drivers for change uh, in higher education. And I'm going to base these on um, the daily report. Um, as, as uh, reflected in Ellis and Kellerman's uh, 2019 work. Um, and, and, and as I talk about the drivers for change in higher education, I'm also looking at some of the scenarios for future education, how education is going to look like in the future, given the drivers for change. The first driver for change that I'm going to talk about is, is future skills. 
and and uh, if we look at uh, the the report in terms of the the uptake and the percentage, it's, it's the, the highest, which is seventy six percent, and and by future skills, uh, it's a situation where they are looking at a, a shift in the kind of graduate attributes um, that we want our students to have, um, moving away. Uh, or, or maybe actually uh, having a combination of the current skills that we have, but add others that will be needed in the in the future, given the advent of technology, given the 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 the, the, the changes and and the and the adoption of technology increasingly within the higher education space. And and here you look at uh, skills such as complex problem solving skills such as dealing with uh, uncertainty because we are living in an uncertain world that changes all the time and also skills around developing a sense of responsibility for yourself for your own studies and and, and for your entire uh, workspace and here if we look at the 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 scenario for the future we, we they are predicting a future skills university scenario in which um in, in, in combination to what we currently teach in our curriculum, where we, we teach knowledge acquisition and maybe uh, skills acquisition, we are all now going to be able to look at um, um, having a combination and maybe a complementary role regarding the kind of future skills that we need and the current knowledge acquisition that we currently have. And then the next uh, <clears throat> driver for change in higher education is lifelong learning at uh, university. Um, and we see it is increasingly becoming 65% uh, being adopted as a driver for change. Um, and, and in that, we look at um, primarily the kind of students that we have in front of us. We, 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 we know the traditional student um, and we know the kind of uh, product that we have to produce for that kind of student. But then increasingly, uh, what we're going to see in the future kind of education that we will have is a lifelong learning scenario where your learner, someone who's working, is your primary learner. Uh, he comes from the workspace. And um, they are going to have a choice of uh, the kind of skill that they need and the competency that they need from us as higher education institutions. And therefore, uh, they will be given a high level of autonomy to decide what they want. We, we, we would not uh, be in a position where we, dis we prescribe as we are currently doing. And then we look at the third driver for change, which is multi-institutional pathways. Um, we, 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 we see that as being about taking up 63% of that space of driving future of higher education. And here um, we look at um, a space that where not only one institution will be a provider of a particular uh, program, but we move in towards multi-institutional modes um, where higher education will happen through alliances of several institutions. Uh, it, it, we now move, will be moving to a networked, what they call a networked university scenario um, in which um, one a single institution provider turns into a multiple site institutions. And um, I think when we look at what is currently happening with the move towards um,
colleagues, I think Prof might want to cut off uh, a bit of the signal. I'll try to get it back online. Just give me two minutes. Thank you. Are you able to hear me now? Ah, uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Yeah. So Perfect. I, I had connectivity challenges. I'm sorry. That's a challenge. That. No, it's fine, Prof. Thanks. Yes, and then uh, the last uh, part is the personalization of um, academic learning. And in this one, uh, students actively cooperate with their lecturers or their curriculum advisors to build their own uh, curriculum and, and, and uh, education programs. And in this, um, we, we, it's more, it, look, it, it moves more towards a flexible, personalized and a participatory model of how to uh, provide a, 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 a higher education. And um, it moves away from our upfront predefined curriculum and, and allows students the flexibility to decide. On, on how they want to, to take the offerings. Um, and now um, we can then move to the next slide, um, which was the UNISA Academic Development Framework. I want us to skip that. Um, where should I go back? I'm seeing a, a note there, Denzel. Sorry, Prof, where are you? Where do they want me to move back to? Someone just posted something on the on the chat to say I should go back to some slide. For oh, the, the multi-university, I think it's the last slide with the, the different types of universities. OK, on, on that one, uh, what I wanted to say was that a provision of higher education is going to move from a concept of a one institution module that provides a single qualification or a program uh, to a multi-institutional model where you now begin to see a networked university scenario uh, with a, a multiple um, institutions providing different components of a qualification. And, and there I was, I was uh, making reference to currently, if you look at the unbundled university uh, uh, move across uh, South Africa in particular, um, you will find that this is already beginning to show that element where you outsource certain elements of what you do as an institution to um, a company to, to provide for you. And um, I think that's that's what I wanted to say there. And then I, we can then move on to the next slide. Um, Denzel, we can uh, skip the one on the UNISA Academic Development Framework, and then we start with the the slide number eight. Uh, and Denzel, yes, we can. Yeah, we can. We can go. Yes. Um, if we start with um, the institutional, if if we look at uh, capacity development um, interventions and in the framework that UNISA has in place. It looks at three elements. Um, it looks at the staff component. It looks at the students component. It also looks at the institutional component. Uh, the institutional component, I will start with that. And, and that is where um, you need strategic leadership. That is where you need institutional buy-in at a, at a very high level on whatever interventions or initiatives that you want to bring into the institution. You also need issues around policies, strategies on how you want to implement whatever initiatives or interventions that you, 
you, you aim at doing. And if you look at the current academic development framework of UNISA, it talks about um, in, in integration of um, academic development strategies. It talks about um, the issues of curriculum development, integrating all these elements of uh, uh, um, capacity development of either students or, st or, or staff. And so um, at that strategic level, that's where you need uh, buy-in, that's where you need uh, uh, someone who will drive the notion of not working in silos, but recognizing the fact that if you work together collaboratively, you would be able to uh, uh, achieve much more. And so um, the, the, the leadership also needs to provide resources that are required in order to run uh, with a program. The leadership would also be at a position, at an institutional level to, to drive change, to drive a change management strategy so that if they come from the top, if they come from the leadership, they, they, they will get more, more buy-in, they will get a, a more, more, more um, impetus as, as, as they get implemented. And of course, the, 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 the leadership, uh, the way in which uh, change would be initiated should not be a top-down uh, approach. Um, it, it has to be consultative. It can start from the bottom and it can go up, but then you need that buy-in from the leadership to be able to drive so that there is institutional will to take whatever initiative that might be on the ground to, to make it a success. And, and then um, if we then look at uh, the staff component. I will start with the first one um, that talks about um, the pedagogy for um, active learning classroom and collaborative designs. Um, when I started earlier, I asked uh, whether we do have the competencies to be able to engage in an online space. Do we have the competencies to be able to design our our, our course material, our assessment uh, strategies such that they, 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 they allow for this kind of, of pedagogies. And perhaps this is an element that we might want to look at as, as UNISA to reflect on. I know that um, um, there they, they are um, a lot of uh, move, uh, moves and, and it has already started with, with the, the framework for curriculum uh, trans, uh, uh, development where the, one of the elements of, of transformation is to incorporate active learning. Um, and, and, and whilst that might be integrated in the design of the curriculum, do, do we have the capacity then to teach that as well? And maybe that could be an, as, an aspect that could be looked into when you, you think about a, a, a capacity development uh, interventions for academics. To, to, to give them the capacity to be able to, to, to teach, to facilitate and to assist students with that kind of, 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 of teaching. Then the next one is your innovative approaches to blended learning designs. Um, um, and um, I, I will not dwell much on this, but uh, I had actually thought I would provide some links to, to the framework and, and, to the, and to the design itself. Uh, as, as reflected by the AG course uh, website. And, and you could have a look at how, what are some of the innovative designs of, of blended learning uh, that, that, that could be used as, as innovative within the space. Um, and then the other issue becomes the issue of the kind of, I think there are a lot of pedagogies that can be used uh, for online learning, but I found the one on community of inquiry a very interesting and useful one that we could think of as a starting point. And, and it looks at three elements of, of competencies for online instructors. It looks at the social presence competency, the um, um, pedagogical presence. It also looks at a uh, cognitive presence. And when we talk about a uh, social presence, the competency of the instructor there is to try and design interactive uh, activities that, that reduces social distance between the instructor themselves and the student, and also that in, enhances social cohesion. So, so th the lecturer in that space, and I think at UNISA, uh, we use uh, online tutors 
to try and, and, and do that kind of work. But then the lecturers themselves, when they also engage in online teaching with students, this is one of the competencies that they would need to be able to know how do we uh, facilitate an interactive space that allows students and, and, and lecturers not to have a, 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 a distance between them. And then the second one, um, it's also your, your pedagogical presence. The, 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 the need there is to create interactive um, spaces that enhances design, organization, management, effective communication and feedback and facilitate active learning. Um, and so the lecturer has to have that competency to, 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 to know how to facilitate online, how to create that active learning space, how to manage that online space, how to create effective communication and, and nudge the students to come in and begin to work. And, and then uh, the last one, um, your, your, your cognitive presence, the competencies that are required there is to create interactive spaces that contributes to meaning making for the students to provide content for the students and to explain and to clarify. And so within that online space. And so those are just some of the, 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 the competencies that I thought I would draw from the, from the um, uh, um, um, this model that I am, am using. And, and, and for, for us to think about maybe as a starting point, these could be pointers that we could think of that we could then use as we uh, build, uh, develop our capacity development interventions for our staff to see whether indeed they, they have that competency. And then um, if I then look at the last element of the student sites, um, I'm going to particularly refer to the future skills uh, that are uh, indicated in the international daily study. They looked at some of the future skills and um, and, and, and I want to define that future skills. What, what is it? It's the ability to act successful on a complex problem in a future unknown context of action. And, and that's the definition that's given by Ellis and Kellerman. Um, and, and when you look at that kind of, of skill that is required, it's, it's a skill that requires adaptability. It is, it's a skill that requires flexibility. It's a skill that does not say, I've got the knowledge and I'm now going to apply the knowledge. It goes beyond just going to apply the knowledge. It, it, it goes beyond and says, if I'm thrown into an unknown situation like remote learning, what do I do? How do I translate what I know into the unknown and then begin to, to, to function in that unknown? And when we look at the world of work, there's a lot that is changing out there. And if our students do not have that competency to be able to adapt to an unknown situation, maybe that's where we find ourselves struggling with students not having degrees but not finding employment because they are not in finding themselves in that space where they can get out of what they know and apply what they know to a, to a different situation. And if we then look at some of the, the skills there are your autonomous learning, self-organization, digital literacy, um, which I know that it is it forms part of the uh, academic development framework of UNISA, um, the issue of dealing with uncertainty, being creative, being innovative. Those are the skills that we need to begin to think of if we want to then move into the university of the future. Remember those future universities that I spoke about earlier, your networked university. Um, yeah and the other kinds of, of, of universities, future skills, where in the future, this is what's going to de de define who we are as a higher education institution. Are we going to prepare our students for that kind of environment? Do we also have the skills to be able to deal with the students who comes and knocks at our door and say, I don't want this curriculum that you have uh, uh, put together for me. I want to design my own. Are we as, as, as lecturers going to be equipped enough to be flexible to, to deal with that kind of future that is coming our way? When we have a, a lifelong learners who already have maybe acquired some their own degrees and, and, and certificates, but then they just want to come into the system and take a particular module 
just so that they are able to equip themselves with what they need for that very uh, environment that they want. Are we flexible enough to, to then think around um, uh, coming up with micro, micro credentials and say, we can uh, accredit you, we can allow you to do this, we can accredit you, and you can take this and you can go. And I think uh, maybe that's something that was spoken uh, about in, in, on, on Monday session. The other issue that we need to, to think about is the issue around um, competen competency-based assessments. And, and especially if we want to really be an open university. I know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking something that maybe is far-fetched, but I think it's, it's really in our future. There are some institutions that are already implementing competency-based assessments. Students are able to take uh, exams whenever they feel they are ready. And we, we do not uh, give specific time frames for exams or for assignments. When I'm ready and, and I'm a, and an independent learner and, and I'm, I'm, I'm well organized, I, I want to, to, to study and then I'm ready. I want to take my assignment and submit it. I want to take my exam and get out of the system as soon as I'm ready. And, 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 and those are the things that we need to think about as we think of the, the, the future of what we are faced with currently. And, and be able to then um, equip ourselves maybe as, as, as an institution, at an institutional level, begin to have that vision of thinking about where we are going in future as an institution, given especially the fact that now online learning or distance education is no longer a, 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 a exclusive to UNISA, but all other institutions were forced to do that because of remote learning. What is it that UNISA can contribute, which may be unique and, 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 and that can actually drive uh, education into the future as we see it from how it's being predicted uh, across the globe within the space. And so, um, yeah, and then my last slide then um, asks a few questions and I think it just relates to some of the things that I was saying. To what extent are our current teaching practices facilitative of future skills? I think those are some of the questions that I was asking earlier. And how ready are we to embrace the global future trends of higher education, given what is coming, given what we have? And I think we, the, the, we sit with a lot of potential um, as UNISA to, to be able to take um, higher education into a, a totally different space. And I think also looking at the role of UNISA as an open university that's supposed to create greater access. Are we using that, at, that to our advantage? Are we trying to look at better opportunities of trying to widen up that access and creating uh, possibilities for those that may not otherwise have that opportunity? I think I will stop there. Thank you very much, Denzel. Thank you Thank so you much. So much. Oh. I think I you've think you, uh, uh, you, you've captured this so well uh, in terms of where we are as an institution. Uh, and as I listened to your your presentation, you know, throughout uh, in every slide, in, and uh, even towards the end, with the three elements of staff, students, institution, uh, the two questions that, that that kept on coming to my mind were was one: uh, what makes Unisa unique? In this COVID land, in this post-COVID, post-COVID landscape, uh, considering the fact that the majority of universities are moving towards uh, an online supplement, what defines us as an institution? And that's something that we really need to get back to, to looking at what gives us that cutting edge. Uh, and the second point is that our, our one of the very first focus areas of our strategy, of our 20, uh, 2030 strategy, is to accelerate the pace towards becoming the leading. Odell University in Africa. Uh, and if we want to do that, then we cannot uh, reflect on those three dimensions that you spoke about, the students, uh, the co competencies that we're building, the, the type of employment uh, or employability that we are preparing our students for, which goes back to the, to the, to the basic assumption of what type of graduate are we producing. Uh, also, then the second is the staff competencies. Uh, how are we equipping our staff for this transition uh, in this new university or this new norm that we are now proposing uh, that that forces our country to be um, to be embracing? And the third one 
is thinking of, and, and I see this being flagged right through the comments, that are, is the institutional world, the realignment of the institutional world towards this transition, preparing the ideal environment, preparing the transition, and revisiting some of the things that we've taken in the normal UNISA, and I say normal UNISA in inverted commas, to rethinking what it means for us as an institution in this new space. So those are critical elements, and I thank you for that, Prof, because I think your presentation actually flagged that much, much more critically for us in terms of us as an institution. Uh, colleagues, I want to open up the space for feedback and comments, uh, questions. I see there's a lot of comments, so please let's engage Prof on this. Uh, while we are waiting for colleagues to raise their hands, uh, let me go through some of the, the comments uh, while colleagues, colleagues, please feel free to your mics and now you now have the ability to unmute your mic. So please feel free to raise your hand and I'll give you the floor so you can pose your question. Um, I, I see there's a, there's a comment by uh, Suri Naidu. Uh, we have, we also have a factor, factor student numbers that spend into uh, 20,000 in mega modules. Uh, I think that's quite critical is the idea of dealing with the student, the scalability of the student numbers. Um, Tabita wrote, uh, effective integration of SACWA exit level outcomes will work while in closing any gap that could be there for future skills. Uh, Chakawira uh, also wrote, uh, competency-based assessment, student taking assessments or exam when ready, sounds interesting. However, how practical when you have 500 students registered per semester? Uh, I think that that's an important Important point, Prof. I don't know if you want to respond to that. I know you were partly here at UNISA when we moved on to the uh, online. Uh, is the issue of scalability and our uh, uh, large modules, uh, if you want to respond to that, Prof, I think your mic is mute. Uh, thank you, Denzel. I, I do quite appreciate uh, the, the question around the issue of scalability, but then it also goes back to how do we structure our assessments? Are our assessments structured such that we can be able to deal with issues of scalability or our assessments? Uh, and, and in fact, scalability, but then within an online environment. Are our assessments structured such that we, 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 we're still thinking of a different mode of, of print-based where we, we allow uh, ass assignments to come in a particular format or are we, are we restructuring our assessments to allow us to be able to deal with uh, online engagement uh, processes? Because if, if you look at issues of, uh, of, of online assessment, you might want to think of a different way of assessing. You might want to look at, if you look at collaborative uh, uh, learning, there might be collaborative work that students might produce. You might want to think of portfolios, portfolios where students are able to give you uh, uh, the, uh, all assessments that they've been doing throughout the year. But then look at how do you then use them such that they, 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 you are able to deal with those uh, large scale numbers. Thanks for that, Prof. I think that's quite critical, especially when we talk about realigning our assessment strategies. Uh, then there's two comments by uh, by Salosh and Molato, and I think this actually leads into each other. Uh, Salosh notes that uh, the interdependencies of staff, students, and institution is pivotal in driving change towards institution goals, mission, and vision. I think that's quite critical, is realigning those interdependencies uh, and creating space for them. And Molato, Molato notes that we have to accept that the institution needs to remodel itself against these pointers uh, to remain competitive and relevant, uh, new skill sets and competencies will be required for staff, students, and management in order to operate with the new normal. Uh, and I think those are quite critical. It's also highlighted by your presentation quite uh, quite interestingly, Prof, is where we need to rethink, remodel, re-envision, build the competencies of our staff, students, and the institution in terms of management, et cetera, and realign some of those developments. Uh, so I think uh, uh, going back from your presentation, it, it's, it, the COVID has actually accelerated our shift, uh, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, but we find ourselves in a new space that we need to start redefining how we position ourselves in that space. And uh, your presentation actually highlighted uh, the future of the university is the future, but also contextualized uh, a lot of the a lot of the elements that we must take into consideration as we start uh, really grappling with some of these critical uh, elements, especially when we start 
thinking now in the post-COVID context, uh, how the university has changed and what does it mean for us in terms of going forward? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think I said no other points or questions. So thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, the last opportunity, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand uh, and we can give you the floor. Uh, Prof, thank you very, very much for that. I think if colleagues raise their questions, uh, we will always pose the questions to you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Prof. Uh, just one quick one. I see that some of the colleagues have asked if we if you can give, give us permission to share your presentation. Will that be OK? I'll definitely. Yes, no, it's fine. You can do okay. that. I thank forgot you. that I sent it to you already. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Prof. So colleagues, I will share that presentation as well. Uh, colleagues, we now come towards the end of it. So Prof, thank you very, very much for your opportunity for thank you for taking your time. Firstly, especially in a new job. I know it's time consuming, but you have taken the opportunity to share with us and engage with us, uh, also drawing from your knowledge uh, in Germany, uh, in the course that you've done, plus your exposure at the new university. Uh, we appreciate that, but also we also appreciate the fact that you were able to contextualize a lot of the developments that we had over the past few, few days uh, to, to where we are and what we need to go. So thank you very much for that, Prof, and on behalf of the team, we appreciate your support and thank you for that. Thank you, Denzel. Thanks. Uh, colleagues, we've now come towards the end of the program, uh, but before I end over to Salosh, uh, Governor, to Dr. Salosh Governor, to do the official vote of thanks, uh, I wonder if I can, if it would allow me the opportunity just to ask Prof. Mashile if he's got any closing comments uh, over these two days, uh, since he's the, uh, he gives me an opportunity. Prof, if you've got any closing comments over the two days, uh, please, Prof, feel free. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tensa. Uh, I think the, the, the whole issue around the uh, policy area in terms of uh, open educational resources, in terms uh, of uh, thinking about uh, new ways of working uh, in the uh, in, in areas like when we have a pandemic like this, uh, are aspects that uh, this this uh, similar series have indicated that we need to pay attention to uh, the. Uh, the, the the metaphor of, of having to to be constructing the <laughs> the, the the plane whilst it's it's flying, uh, uh, implying the the different elements that we need to build into uh, our model of uh, student support, uh, our models of ensuring that students can succeed, uh, really resonated uh, well with me. So so there are uh, a large number of uh, areas that have been uh, identified uh, in this uh, similar series uh, that will really uh, uh, place the, the project, uh, the Academic Development Virtual Hub, uh, on a trajectory that I see, I think, will just be uh, to improve our practices and uh, our ability as an institution to be responsive uh, to future needs. So uh, I, I trust that the the, the, the insights that have been uh, given or uh, have been shared here by both the keynote speakers and the panel, the input that we've been receiving from, sorry, uh, the, the participants uh, will enable us uh, to really uh, craft a vision for academic development uh, at UNISA. So really I'm grateful for uh, all the input that has been shared and I really uh, wish you well, uh, Denzel, in ensuring that uh, all these things uh, are put together into a program of action that will only lead us from strength to strength. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Prof. And also for giving me the additional work to drive this. I think the colleagues have opened up. I'm reading the comments here. The colleagues have opened up so much of opportunities for us at UNISA to engage with. Uh, but colleagues, we and I think I echo what Prof. Mashile said as well, is that your participation, your input uh, as participants have actually opened up new spaces and brought that voices to the fore, which we acknowledge. Uh, so thank you very much. And also thank you, Prof, to you. I know your schedule was busy, but you managed to stay with us throughout this day. So thank you very much, Prof, for that. We appreciate that. Uh, colleagues, 
the last part of uh, uh, before I give it over to uh, Salosh. Just know that this is the the first of our of our series to come. And as Prof said, we will use the input. Prof Mashida said we will use the input to drive the future uh, series that we have and seminars, so that we feed back into this and we have a continuity in terms of our discussions. Um, Salosh, let me give this over to you for the final vote of thanks, Salosh, uh, Dr. Salosh Kamanda. Thanks, Salosh. Good afternoon, Prof. Mashila, owner of the DHET ADOV project, distinguished guests, speakers, and colleagues. On behalf of the VP's teaching and learning portfolio and the Directorate of Tuition, Sport, and Facilitation of Learning, we would like to extend our heartfelt thanks and appreciation to all of you for attending today's seminar. Your attendance to this seminar is evident of your commitment and interest to innovations in teaching and learning aimed at producing the much needed high quality graduates across the system. Paul West, Tony, uh, Paul West Dr. Tony Leliot, and Prof. Machepo Matuani, we extend our sincere thanks to you for not only sparing your invaluable time, but also for contextualizing the innovations and unpacking the international trends on what teaching and learning means within the context of South Africa. Colleagues, allow me to highlight some of the key issues raised today. Paul West clarified the notion of becoming more open. Paul West broadened our understandings on the use, design and accessibility of OERs. He reminded us that quite often we are driven by monetary reasons. The products that we write is a product we sell. Why should this be the case? He asked. We need to consider creating materials for openness where the materials can be shared more openly. And he also reminded us of the core principles of anything described as being open uh, by just, uh, um, using the five R's, R's, retain, revise, remix, reuse, and, and redistribute. And here again, he posed the critical question, are we reproducing the materials irrespective of the context that we are teaching in, or are we adapting the material and thinking about how we can best use these resources to suit the context? Tony, Dr. Tony Lilliot highlighted the alternate approaches to CPD for university academics. As an alternative to face-to-face -face CPDs, academics can be, cap can be capacitated through clearly articulated institutional policies. And colleagues, you will agree that even uh, Prof. Matawane, in her integrated model, she highlighted the uh, role of the institutions in uh, academic development. The next point was uh, online learning pathways, creating online learning pathways as a means to CPD. And the third is using high quality OERs. And you would also recall, if you read the chats, colleagues, that the question of uh, quality came to the fore here. Okay. And to, um, Dr. Tony highlighted the six learning pathways that's available, finding open content, adapting open content, design for learning, design for learning, and communicating research findings on the website. Tony, from the chat com comments, we are all looking forward to visiting your site and engaging with the learning pathways. And lastly, Prof. Machepo Matwane. Welcome, Prof. Prof is a colleague who is well known to the UNISA community and she provided a provocative coverage on rethinking academic development in an era of crisis and innovation. Prof Matwane used an interesting, an interesting analogy of trying to fly an, aer an airplane while still under construction to highlight the challenges of having to switch remotely. And this uh, metaphor or this analogy was most uh, appropriate for highlighting the challenges that uh, remote teaching comes along with. Prof reminded us of the challenges confronting lecturers and students in navigating in the online plat platform. And Prof, you are so right. Uh, I'm sure that all academics will agree that there are challenges on both sides, academics and uh, students. She drew on the difference between student engagement and student assessment colleagues. And that for me was uh, one of my takeaway as well because um, we look at student engagement and student assessment as uh, being synonymous, but there is a difference there. It requires skills in designing both 
student engagement and student assessment. She highlighted the interdependencies of staff, students and the institution and interrogated the integrated approach to inform areas for capacity development. Colleagues, to all our distinguished speakers, we were most inspired by your wisdom and knowledge sharing. Next, I would like to thank the attendees for your active participation, your open dialogue and your contributions in the chat. We look forward to your continued participation in the forth forthcoming events and to your very stimulating exchange of ideas. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the torch bearer of this project, none other than Dr. Denzel Chetty, together with his project team members for the logistical support and the guidance in ensuring the success of the seminar. An event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels start ro rolling long before. We have been fortunate to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues in the project team. My concluding comment is that while COVID-19 pandemic can be best described as a disruptor, as articulated by Prof. Mashila in his opening remarks, to some extent, this dark cloud has a silver lining. It has stretched us in ways previously thought impossible. It has brought out the best in many, and I hope that we will use our newly honed capabilities to better manage the future of university education and, and specifically our endeavors to enhance student success through hybrid teaching and learning. Online teaching as part of the hybrid model is an important element in our efforts to enrich students' learning experiences and to prepare uh, students for the future. Program director, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we thank you for joining us. I sincerely apologize if I missed out anybody. Thank you again, all of you. It's been a great pleasure having you here. Thank you very much, Salosh, for this warm, for this warm word of thanks, those words, as well as capturing the, the events for the day. Thank you very, very much. I think you've done excellent in recapping uh, the event, but also raising some of the issues of where we need to go forward from this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with Salosh's warm words of uh, word of thanks, uh, it now gives me an opportunity to finally say thank you to one of you, or to each one of you, for joining us over the two days. It's been amazing having you, and we look forward to having you in future events. Please watch this space, and also uh, through the networks that we've now established, uh, we will circulate upcoming events. Uh, also, colleagues, I would like to just quickly take this opportunity to say that we've put together a series of MOOCs, as noted by Solosh earlier, the colleagues of the Academic Development Open, Open Virtual Hub. We have a very good team, an excellent team that is working with us, uh, and they've went out and put together a series of MOOCs and open education resources that you can benefit from. Please watch this space. We will send out an advert as soon as we are ready to release it into the public domain, and you can join those MOOCs, join those OERs, and make good use of it. Thank you very much, colleagues. Lastly, for myself, thank you once again to Prof. Mashila for joining us and the speakers and the adult team uh, that will be behind the scenes. Thank you, colleagues. You are remarkable. Uh, Richard Wright, thanks as well. And all of you for attending this. We wish you well. Uh, and it's been a great having you over these two days. I know it's been long hours, four hours, and you managed and you sat through it with us. So thank you very, very much, colleagues. Uh, and lastly, we wish you well for the rest of the day. Goodbye and God bless each one of you. Thank you, colleagues. Thanks, Denzel.